2,000 years ago in the mythical age, there lived a man who wiped out the nation of humans, burned down the forest of the spirits, and killed off the gods. He was feared as the demon king. He took tyranny to its peak, and before his gaze, even reason. S were obliterated. Who's this demon king? Sit back and find out. It's been two millennia since the demon king's demise, and in this present year, the founder will awaken, as it is said. A demon king academy, Delsgade, an elite constitution tasked with determining the demon king when he awakens, is created. The incoming class includes members of the generation of chaos, among whom may be the demon king reincarnated. They believe that when the founder does indeed make his return, the Infernal Realm will surely be enveloped by cries of joy. It's the examination day at Demon King Academy. A young lady named Misha Necron is seen walking towards the Academy's gate and being hailed and wished well by a man. She looks back and two men talking accidentally hit her, and her letter falls off her hand. A guy picks it up and hands it over to her, and she thanks him. The guy's parents are seen shouting at the top of their voice hailing and wishing him well, as the other man wishes Misha. As they walk towards the Academy entrance, Zepis of the Indu family laughs at them for bringing their parents to the exam. They walk past him, and Zepis gets mad for replying to him. The guy tells him his magic power is so weak that he missed it. Zepis gets mad, and he shows his power, and flame of darkness, and advises that they beg for their life before he reduces them to skeleton. The guy infuses magic in his breath, and kills off the flame. Zepis attempts to move closer, but the guy holds him still with magic that Zepis can't move his body. He tells Zepis to take a time out until he learns his lesson and walks inside. It's time to begin the entrance exam for practical skills, and the practical skill test is a duel between examinees in which the loser fails. After taking the magic power assessment and the aptitude test, the five winners will be admitted to the Demon King Academy. During the test, they'd be permitted to use all kinds of equipment. The match will be decided when one of the examinees is incapacitated or declares that he's giving up. So the practical skills test begins with the guy and Zipis of the Hindu family. And Zipis seems to be well known by the people. Well, yeah, they meet again on a clear stage. Zipis tells the guy that he will turn his pompous face into a blubbering mess and make him puke blood. The guy infuses magic in his eyes, but Zipis doesn't fall for it because he wears an anti-demonic armor that conceal any kind of magic power. Zipis tells him that incapacitated means he's allowed to kill him, so he brings out his sword and says, Magic sword, Ziprid, a relic from the mythical age that was handed down to the Indus family, that can amplify one's magic power more than tenfold. The guy laughs and tells him that the sword is just one, so it would only increase by ten. Zipis attempts to attack with his sword, but the guy infuses magic in his breath and kills off the flame. The guy says they shouldn't be facing off against each other in the first place, so he decides to handicap himself. He tells Zepis that he won't move a step from his spot, won't use magic, and won't infuse any magic power into his words or breath. Also, without batting an eyelash and his limbs, he will still defeat him. But Zepis thinks he's making excuses because he can't get past his anti-demonic armor. While Zepis bluffs, his blood overheats and bursts out of every hole in his body. The guy infuses magic in his heart that Zepes overheats, and more blood bursts out till he falls on his knees. Despite all of this, Zepes still talks and tells him to make him give up. Zepes says to him that he's just a bottom feeder who can only use compulsion magic to bend things to his will. The guy finds his idea interesting and quickly kicks Zepes in the face. The guy tells him that if he can surrender without using compulsion magic, Anos wins, but if he can't, then Zepes wins. Zepis says he wants a contract. The guy seals their contract by chanting, Zek. Zepis then tells him that he'll never give up even if he dies. The guy snaps his hand and Zepis completely bursts out into pieces. The guy doesn't lose this way because they already agreed, so he chants Ingal to resurrect Zepis. Zepis and the people watching their fights are surprised to experience that. The guy asks Zepis if he's ready to give up. But Zepis argues instead, so the guy snaps his hand again and resurrects him. The guy tells him he'll never die in the true sense as long as the root remains. He tells him about the three seconds rule that he can use to resurrect him risk-free if he uses Ingol within three seconds. Three seconds later, Zepis alters nothing. Then the guy remembers such a surefire joke that happened two millennia ago. He also remembers that Zepis said he'd never give up even if he died. Then, he snaps and resurrects Zepis repeatedly until he kneels and bows and accepts that he loses. The people are shocked and start asking questions like who is the guy and all sorts. Then, they begin the magic power assessment, where they'd touch a crystal and their energy potency by the number shown on a screen. People read their energy, and Misha's shows 100,246. The guy commends that, and he steps forward to read his. He touches the crystal, and it reads zero on the screen and the crystal breaks into pieces. Misha confesses that she's never seen that before 
but dominant eyes are her thing. The next is the aptitude test, where they will be evaluated on how they stack up against the Demon King of Tyranny and verify their knowledge of him. Both the guy and Misha get all the questions correct and then they meet outside after the aptitude test. The guy asks Misha if she can stop by his place to celebrate, and she agrees to follow him home. Misha says she can use flight magic, but the guy tells her that he uses a faster one. She holds his hands and he chants, Gatam, a teleportation magic that was lost during the mythical age, that takes them to his house entrance. They walk inside, and his mom asks about the examination, and he answers fine. His mom congratulates him and wonders how smart he can be to pass such an exam just one month after being born. His mom asks him what he'd like to have, then he mentions mushroom gratin. However, his mom is aware that he's mentioned that, so she already prepared it. His mom sees Misha and asks him who she is. The guy introduces her as Misha Necron, and they met at the academy. His mom flies up and yells in the joy that his one-month-old boy brings home a wife. The guy feels sorry for Misha and his mom can be quick to jump to conclusions. Moments later, his dad bangs into the room and yells in joy too. While they're having a meal together, his mom asks Misha what she likes about his son, and she answers his kindness because he picked up her letter for her. His mom says that the boy was ready for Dalhade, but he decided to bring herself and his father along so they won't miss him so much. His mom asks both of them which of them made the first move, and the guy answers that he was the one. After the meal, the guy and Misha take a walk outside. The guy feels sorry about his boisterous parents, and he mentions that the lady's father was boisterous, but she tells him that he's not her father, just a guardian. The guy asks about her father, and she replies that they're around, but they're busy. She tells him that he's kind-hearted, but he laughs and tells her that she'd never be the first to say such to him. Instead, they tell him, you're doing this world no favors by being alive. Devil demon, fiend, etc. He confesses that he deserved every word, and the blame lies within him. She tells him to crouch down a little, and touches his head. He stands and says he'd tell his parents that she's his comrade, meaning friend, and she agrees. All of a sudden, a voice chants, Iris, creation magic, and a full fight stage forms around them. It's Zeppis, his brother, and some guards. Zeppis' brother introduces himself as Demon Lord Leorg Indu, and he has come because the guy took care of his brother, Zeppis. Zeppis laughs and says, hybrids can't beat royalty even. If they have little power in Delsgade and he asks the guy what he thinks it is, well, he answers that they get snuffed out because if they win. He keeps boasting about his brother and his brother grabs him by the shirt and calls him a shameless loser. Demon Lord Leorg burns Zeppis with lightning magic. The guy says he thinks he's here to back his little brother, but Demon Lord Leorg tells him that it doesn't change the fact that the guy is going to die too. He claims that his family has interrupted the nobility of the great demon king of Tyranny and they can't stand Idla when they are insulted by a mongrel. The guy tells him a demon king is someone who uses his power to bend everything to his will. Demon Lord Leorg brags about what he said, and the guy tells him that he's talking about himself, making light of his great deeds a bad thing. Demon Lord Leorg finds it disrespectful, and he claims that such an attitude calls for certain death. Demon Lord Leorg and his guards bring their magic circle, and the guy infuses magic in his eyes which makes the enemy's magic circles get out of control, going berserk. They all try to control it, but they can't, so it booms. He tells Demon Lord Leorg that magic power is born from the root deep inside the body, and the root will cause one's magical power to go berserk when fearing opponents it's outclassed by. Demon Lord Leorg stands up and vows that he won't allow himself to be defeated by a mongrel, so he shows his forbidden spell, the origin spell, that can only be used by royalty. He chants Geraced and throws it at him, but nothing changes. The guy tells him that origin magic can't affect the origin itself, meaning that it does not affect him. Then, he decides to give Demon Lord Leorg one chance. He moves close to Zeepis' body, chants Egram, and resurrects him into a zombie. The zombie moves towards his brother in pain, screaming, it hurts. Why did you have to kill me? Demon Lord Leorg throws his lightning magic at him, but the zombie stops it with its magic. The guy tells him that the zombie acquires devastating magic power, and it burns with hatred for having been killed in exchange, then it racks with the pain of wounds that will never be healed. The guy tells him to acknowledge his little brother, join forces with him, and take him on together. The zombie makes up power and attacks Demon Lord Leorg, and he tells him to call his brother's name. Demon Lord Leorg screams his brother's name, and they both get burned. The guy wonders why the bonds between brothers in this era are so flimsy. Everywhere starts to shake like it's going to collapse, and the guy saves everyone with his power. After it's all cleared, Demon Lord Leorg, Zeepies, and the guards find themselves alive and sitting before the guy. Then, he says he can see that his brethren have weakened significantly in the last 2,000 years. He says he'd be happy to take them on at any time when they come back after they've powered up. Demon Lord Leorg asks him who he is. Then he says, 
Listen up, my beloved descendant. Your founder has returned. I am the true Demon King of Tyranny. I am Anos Voldegoad. This begins with Demon King Anos Voldegoad having a talk with Hero Kanan on how to make peace among demons, humans, spirits, and the gods. Demon King Anos Voldegoad says that between humans and demons can never end unless either the humans or the demons are rooted out for good. He also says that humans are going to make more new enemies like the gods and spirits if the demons get wiped out and this will make humans turn on each other. Hero Kanan agrees that humans are weak but he wants to believe in human kindness. Then, Demon King Anos Voldegoad asks him if he believes in demon kindness, but Hero Kanan sighs. Demon King Anos Voldegoad tells him to trust him for once if he's a hero. He says he'd put up walls between the infernal realm, the human realm, the spirit realm, and the heavenly realm, and install a door that won't open for at least a thousand years by dying for the sake of peace. He added that he won't be wiped out completely, but he could be reincarnated after 2,000 years from now. Hero Kanon agrees to trust him. Both Demon King Anos Voldegoad and Hero Kanon never thought they'd see the day when they'd thank each other. Then, they get it done as planned, and Demon King Anos Voldegoad thanks and tells Hero Kanos that if he ever happens to be reincarnated after 2,000 years, he will be his friend. After 2,000 years, King Anos gets reincarnated, and he shocks his parents when he talks on the first day he is born. He says his name is Anos Voldegoad. Anos gets his result, and it's written that he's unfit to become a demon lord, so he wonders what has gone wrong. Misha tells him that only the descendants of the founding ancestors are allowed to enroll at the Demon King Academy, and no one from the demon clan has ever been rated as unfit, except for Anos, meaning that he's the first misfit. Anos finds it odd because he can't remember himself making any blunders in the aptitude test. So he asks her if she knows the name of the founding ancestors, and Misha answers yes, but they're not supposed to say it. Anos suggests they talk through the mind, so he places his hand on her head, and she says the name Avos Dilheva, the Demon King of Tyranny. He asks who Avos is, and she tells him that no one in the Demon King clan doesn't know his name. From this, he could tell that the wrong name had been handed down for the last 2,000 years. He then asks Misha what people say about the Demon King of Tyranny, and Misha replies both ruthless and benevolent, always thinking only of the Demon clan. He fought without any regard for himself. Misha is buttressing the whole stuff when a lady passes by just to check the badge on Anos's dress, and then she leaves. A woman named Amelia Ludowell addresses herself as the homeroom teacher for class 2, and decides to divide the class into teams. So anyone who wishes to lead a team to announce themselves but with a condition, which is that the person must be able to wield the troop magic, guys, which boosts the group's overall combat power. She says that when the leader activates guys, each member of their team will be assigned one of seven, king, guardian, etc. She added the spellcaster becomes king, and since the king must constantly supply his subordinates with magic power, he is weaker on his own. She also says that she's going to allow the use of guys in the team competition in a week. People who wish to become leaders start raising their hands, including the lady who interrupted Anos and Misha's discussion. And lastly, Anos raises his hand. Miss Amelia feels sorry and tells him that hybrid students aren't eligible, then he says all he has to do is prove that hybrids are in no way inferior to demon royalty, so they can zeal it with a zect. Miss Amelia tells him that if he fails, he'd have to apologize for his disrespect and drop out of the school. He comes from his space to do it, and he eventually did it. He asks if it was demon royalty who drew the flawed one up. Miss Amelia disagrees and says, no flaws have ever been made for the past 2,000 years. He says that he did it before he was reincarnated. He touches the flawed one and it changes like it's being renewed. Miss Amelia seems so surprised and confused, but she agrees with him to be a group leader. The class starts to murmur and Miss Amelia claps to stop the murmuring. Miss Amelia says they should start splitting up into teams and they should run for a leader to introduce themselves. The lady who interrupted Anos and Misha's discussion comes out and introduces herself as Sasha Necron, the Witch of Destruction, a part of the Necron family and a direct descendant of Ivis Necron one of the seven elder demon emperors. Anos seems surprised, so Misha tells him that Sasha is her big sister, and their parents are the same. If that's the case, Anos asks Misha why she is wearing the white uniform, and not the red uniform, and she answers that it was a family decision. Miss Amelia calls on Anos to stand up and introduce himself. He introduces himself as Anos Voldegode, the demon king of tyranny. He tells them that the name of the demon king they all believe in is an utter fake. Miss Amelia then tells others to join the leader they wish to serve. Misha decides to be on Anos's team because they're friends. At that moment, Sasha walks towards them and tells Anos that the only teammate he has is a defective little junk doll. She says that Misha is neither a demon nor human, plus she has no life, 
No soul, no will, and she's just a doll made of odds and ends, animated by magic. Well, Anos replies that if she thinks that enchanted dolls have neither life nor soul, then her grasp of magical concepts is too tenuous. He added that she needs to strain her eyes more and peer into the abyss. Sasha commends Misha for having found an intriguing comrade, but Anos appears to be disrespectful to her. Then, she shows her demonic eyes of destruction, but she feels disappointed as it does not affect Anos instead. The wall of the classroom cracks. Anos stands up and shows her that he can do what she's done, and tells her that her magic level isn't half bad. He sits and asks Sasha if she wants to join his team so that she can get closer to Misha. She replies with demonic eyes that she's never taken Misha as her sister, not even once. While Anos and Misha walk home after class, they meet Sasha on the way, and she asks for a duel in which the loser has to do whatever the winner says. Anos agrees, since he believes that he's going to win. Her demonic eyes of destruction come out when she's worked out, says Misha. Then, it means that she can't control them. A week later, Sasha meets with Anos about their duel, and Anos asks her if she wants to seal it with a Zect. She agrees, but she wants Misha to seal it with her, and they do it. Miss Amelia announces the team competition exam between Team Sasha and Team Anos is now underway, and the match will be decided when the king is knocked out, or else unable to maintain guys. Misha asks Anos what their strategy is, and Anos tells her he can't be around the fact that it's just the two of them. Misha says her class is guardian, and she suggests that barricading themselves with Iris will give them the upper hand. Anos knows that the other team will be expecting them to do it, so he thinks they should outmaneuver them. Misha uses Iris's spell to build three castles in their territory, but Sasha knows that two of the castles are traps. Plus, she knows that Misha couldn't have built a complete Demon King castle in such a short time. She decides that her team strikes first by sending a vanguard unit into Anos' territory. She's about to do that when they find out that Anos is already in front of their castle. Sasha wonders if he gets there via Gautam, but then she orders her team to show him he's confusing strategy with audacity. Anos answers that he's not sure that would happen, and they become surprised that he could hear their leaks. He tells them their encryption spell is too flimsy. Sasha tells her team that Anos can eavesdrop all he wants, but he's just a king working solo at the end of the day. She boasts that Anos can't breach a castle built by such a large force. Multiple layers of anti-demonic magic. Anos could feel that the castle is just a pretty lightweight castle, and tells them they have no clue about battle if all they're guarding with is magic. He breaches their castle, lifts it, and throws it up high in the sky, and he stops the fall of the castle with just his hand. He rolls their castle with the tip of one of his fingers, then he throws the castle a long distance from himself, the castle hits the ground and tumbles. Sasha tells her team that they'd be using Geograze, but one of her teammates tells her that the success rate for Geograze is too tiny, but she insists that they use it. She believes that that's the only way to defeat Anos. Anos understands the technique behind Geograze, so he smiles at them. Geograze is a team spell that maximizes each member's unique abilities, while increasing everyone's magic power more than tenfold. The true power of guys. Sasha's team accumulates their power, and they shoot this enormous enormous intensity of fire at Anos, but he returns a pinch of fire compared to theirs, which cancels out their product, takes off all their shields, and hits their broken castle. Although Sasha escapes before the fire hits them, she lands and Anos appears right before her. She asks him how possible he was able to use the Geo Greys by himself, but he replies that he uses Grega, the lowest level fire element spell. She falls to her knees, and Anos reminds her of her promise. She tries to use her demonic eyes of destruction but has no effect. She'll never forget this humiliation, and she vows that she'll get stronger someday and kill Anos. Anos laughs and tells her that if killing him was enough to make him, he would have perished 2,000 years ago. He also says that Misha seems to want her big sister on the same team as herself. Misha runs to check her up, but she insists that she's fine. Since Sasha can't go against Zekt and doesn't have a choice, she agrees to work under Anos. But then she reminds Anos, it's just a contract. Nothing more, plus she doesn't mention that she'd be selling her soul to him. Sasha turns to Misha and tells her that she recruited her for her friend's sake. Sasha believes that Misha does this because of her kindness, but Anos added that Misha does this because Sasha's eyes are beautiful because they harbor immense magic power. She's surprised to hear this top. Anos comes home with Sasha and Misha, but his mom only understands that he comes with bride number two, and his father who has never had two wives embraces it 
and they yell in joy like usual. His mom prepares the mushroom gratin, including Sasha. Later that night, Sasha asks Misha if she likes Anos, and she answers that she likes him. Anos's mom makes more gratin for Sasha and Misha to take home. Anos escorts them a bit, and he asks if he could see them home with Gotham, but Sasha seems to be in the mood for a walk, so they both leave. Anos turns to leave, and he meets Sasha in front of him. She thanks him for helping her to make up with Misha. Then she asks him what he would do if his fate is already sealed, and Anos answers that he wouldn't stress about it if it's not a big deal, but he'll change it if he doesn't like it. He sure can change fate. All he'd have to do is destroy it. Then, Sasha tells him to cover closer a second, but he says pass because he doesn't like orders around. She then requested manners if he could come closer, and he did. She holds and kisses him on the lips, then she says, it is a kiss between friends, just to thank him. Enos is quite the first person she'd ever do that with. Anos thanks her for giving him something valuable. Then, he leaves using the Gautam spell. Sasha says she's glad to meet him after he has left. In addition to Sasha and Misha's conversation at Anos's house, Misha asks Sasha if she likes Anos, but she doesn't. She says Anos can look straight into her eyes, and she wonders what he's seen in her face to say her eyes, her beautiful. Sasha says they're cursed demonic eyes that try to destroy anything in her sight on their own and she's never met anyone with eyes like hers before. She reminds Misha that she used to be like Anos, she used to look straight into her eyes. She thanks Misha for she has stopped hurting others. Then, she asks if Misha could forgive her, and she replies that she's not mad at her. On the next day, Misha asks Anos what she can get for Sasha on her birthday, and Anos tells her that her sister will be happy with whatever she gets for her. Then, she thinks clothes would be okay. Sasha comes and sits next to Anos, but Anos says that it's not for her. She refuses because she feels she can sit there to make a team. Then she mentions that her former teammates want to join their team well, Anos says that he already turned them down. Anos says just the three of them should make for a sufficient force. Sasha says they'd need more than five people to take part in the class competition. The Academy invites one of the seven elder demon emperors to give a special lecture on great magic as the demon king of tyranny is expected to awaken the year. Sasha explains that the founding ancestor used his blood to create seven subordinates 2,000 years ago, the first demon clan to be descended from the founding ancestor. Anos says he remembers that part. Sasha added the Demon King Academy was then created by the seven elder demon emperor to develop future demon lords. Anos finds it odd that the stewardship of the demons born in the mythical age is too sloppy, even with the fact that they run an academy. He expects that they should know about him if there is nothing else behind it. Miss Amelia warns Anos to mind his manners, and he agrees. Miss Amelia introduces Lord Ivis Necron of Seven Elder Demon Emperors, and he walks in. As Lord Ivis walks past Sasha, Anos calls the demon by his name, Ivis, and says, Long time no see. He looks back to see who dares to call him by his name. Then Miss Amelia quickly apologizes to Lord Ivis and says, Anos will be expelled with immediate effect. Anos tells him it's been 2,000 years, and asks Lord Ives if he can still remember him. Unfortunately, Lord Ives tells him that he had lost his memories from 2,000 years ago, but he could remember his master, the Demon King of Tyranny. Anos feels Lord Ives should remember him. Then Lord Ives asks him if he's related to the founding ancestor. Anos touches to make him remember, but seems to be resistant to that memory spell. Lord Ives asks him who he is, but Anos tells him that they'll pick it up again later. The day's lecture will be on the Necron family's secret technique, fusion magic. Lord Ivis explains that fusion magic's advantage lies in the fusion of multiple spells. Also, by fusing different types of magic power with varying wavelengths, one can increase the original level of magic power more than tenfold. He introduces the beginner level, fusion magic, Jai Gum. As he explains, Sasha whispers that Anos takes notes or saves them to a memory crystal, but Anos says he has it committed to memory. Sasha boasts that she's a direct descendant and that she mastered the fusion magic long ago. Anos asks if she's close to Ivis and if she's a direct descendant. Sasha tells him that the seven elder demon emperors are like gods, and she has only spoken to Lord Ivis once. After the day's lecture, Anos meets with Lord Ivis. Lord Ivy confesses that he did go back in time 2,000 years. Anos tells him that he rewinds time locally and extracts the memories he'd lost from 2,000 years, but he sees the Demon King of Tyranny as Avos Dilhevia. It seems like the past itself has been tampered with. Lord Ivis asks him if he's claiming himself as his master, the Demon King of Tyranny, and he says yes. The Demon King of Tyranny's name is Anos Voldegoid, but it was rewritten as Avos Dilhevia by someone 2,000 years ago. Anos can't tell yet, but he's sure it must be the person that arranged erased Lord Ivis's memories. Lord Ivis asks Anos if he's sure he wasn't who erased them. He says that he can't make light of Anos's word, as he possesses powers that defy time, but he can't dismiss the possibility that Anos is hostile to the Demon King of Tyranny. Lord Ivis says he will remain neutral for the time being, 
He added that something about Anos brings back memories, and Anos says it'd be helpful if he could do it. Avos de Villa is someone who's passing himself off as Anos Voldigo. Just that moment that he thinks about it, Miss Amelia calls on him to tell him that someone on his team has dropped her badge, and then he asks, who? Miss Amelia says the one who's not Sasha but Anos finds the way. Miss Amelia oddly put her speech. Well, he collects it and tells her not to worry. Anos finds Misha where she's sitting to give her the badge and he meets her reading the letter he helped her pick on the day of the entrance exams. Misha tells him that it's a letter from the person who raised her. Anos asks if she's not going to read it, and she says it's her good luck charm. Anos and Misha hear Sasha telling her former teammates that she can't do anything about it. One of them says that the misfit, Anos, won't even give them the time of day. Another asks Sasha if she's okay with being stuck on the Anos team. They figure he's looking, and they quickly shut their mouth. Sasha scares them by breaking the earth a bit, and then she walks out on them to meet Anos and Misha. It's time for the dungeon exam. According to Miss Amelia, the students will take on the Demon Palace Delsgade. Each team will compete for points by collecting magical tools, weapons, armor, and the like, and then ownership of the acquired items goes to each team leader. Miss Emlia begins the match. Every team has taken their moves, but Anis's team is still behind standing. Ano says if they can get their hands on the scepter on the altar on the lowest level, they'd give them a perfect score. Sasha says none of the teachers have been to the lowest level, and the thing about there being a scepter is folklore. She also says the scepter is said to be the Demon King's staff, created by the founding ancestors. Then, Amos heads down there to find out, and Sasha asks him how they're going to do that. Well, he stops and answers, this is his castle. As they walk down the castle, Sasha says they said there'd be monsters at large in this exam, but they've been dealt with by the students who went in first. Anos faces Misha and tells her that he'd get her items in the treasure room on the lowest level, and if any remains, they're hers. Anos asks when her birthday is, and she says the same day as Sasha's. Both Misha and Sasha are twins, and they'd turn 15. Misha's shy and she says she doesn't want anything but Anos calms her. Sasha, who has moved far ahead, tells them to walk fast. They get to a secret passageway which he breaks through with no stress, whereas Sasha is still trying to find a door to get through with her demonic eyes. They finally get to an open place that is designed to take in both sunlight and moonlight from outside. They find a door to the altar, and this door's got anti-magic protection that the Geograys level spell can't destroy. Anos uses brute strength to open the door, and they finally meet with the scepter. Anos and Misha enter the treasure room to check for items for their birthday, while they leave Sasha to the scepter. Misha likes the phoenix robe, an item that grants its wearer the benefit of immoral flames, for Sasha. She wants the lily pad ice ring, a ring that gives off the chill that is said to fill the seven seas with ice, for herself. They get back to meet Sasha to give her her birthday present. She's so thrilled to receive a present and Anos excuses them so she can try out the phoenix robe on herself. Sasha opens the door for Anos to come back in there, and he finds Misha dead on the floor with a knife on her chest. He asks Sasha what she has done. Sasha dupes and betrays them, all because of a performance to ensure that she takes first place in the dungeon exam, and she says all her attempts are just to gain access to them. Anos tells her method of betrayal is too tame, and he's not buying it. Anos wants to claim ownership rights as team leader, but Sasha revokes their zect with the scepter. Sasha says she hates Misha acting all nice, trusting no matter how many times she's been duped. Anos tells her, she's not getting away with this, she's done, then she creates a conditioning magic on Misha that the knife will pierce Misha even deeper if he lays so much as a finger on Sasha. Sasha thinks it will take Anos at least 10 seconds to destroy the magical barrier and heal Misha's wound, so she'd have time to get away. She's elevating, and Anos grabs her hand and at the same time breaks the magical barrier and also heals Misha. She's surprised, but Anos tells her that he heals Misha the moment he sees her lying on the floor, and Sasha seeing after them is an illusion he made. Sasha's demon eyes of destruction activate when her emotions run high, but Anos noticed that she wasn't that joyous when Misha mentioned her birthday, plus it only lit up when she received the lobe, so it can easily be told that she made up her mind to stab Misha that moment. Anos then tells her to spit out how she feels. She uses her demonic eyes on Anos, but no effect as usual. Anos makes her body stand still in the air. Misha begs to let Sasha go, but Anos just wants her to tell them everything. Misha insists he let her go, and then Anos drops her. Misha attempts to help, but she stops her. She picks the scepter and flees. Anos tells Misha to tell him about herself. 
As Sasha flees, she says she's got 7 hours and 16 hours left to make it. Misha says she's going to disappear at midnight on her 15th birthday. Anos asks her if it has anything to do with Sasha calling her a magic doll, but she answers that magic doll is not the right term because Necron never existed in this world in the first place, which simply means that Misha was originally Sasha. Anos could tell because Sasha unilaterally destroyed her zect with Misha, and as a matter of fact, it would have been impossible to do normally. It's a different story if the two parties under contract are the same. Anos tells Misha that a spell was used to separate one person into two 2,000 years ago. He asks if it was Ivis Necron behind that, and Misha nods and says she received a share of Sasha's soul when she was a fetus, an existence that should not be who she is. Anos asks her if Ivis cast fusion magic on both Sasha and Misha at the same time, although the spell for fusing two sources doesn't last for very long. So having been separated by magic, the same goes for both Sasha and Misha. Eventually, they'd go back to being one. Anos says that Ivis must have taken advantage of the two spells' unique features to create a more powerful demon race. Division fusion resurrection magic, Dino Jixis, says Misha. Misha says she wants to live a normal life, but her fate is set in stone so she's going to disappear while Sasha will remain. She wanted some memories but no one in the demon race would speak to her since she doesn't exist to them. Only Ano speaks to her and becomes her friend, so she considers it a miracle that happened in her lifetime. She feels sorry, but Anos hugs and stops her from apologizing because she has no reason to feel sorry. Anos confesses that there are two things he's never known, regret and impossibility. Anos promises to make Misha's wish come true, and she says she wants to make up with Sasha. Anos requests that Misha promise him to live like she believes there'll be a tomorrow until her final moment, and she promises. Anos suggests they stop Sasha first. Sasha is still within the building, so they manage to find her. Anos dissolves to her what Misha wants, but Sasha calls her a moron and wonders what she wants after all she did to her. Misha says she wants the truth, so she asks Sasha if she truly hates her. Sasha suggests they duel her again, in that she will create a magic circle, and if he can control its magic then she will answer Misha's question, but if he fails, he will follow her order. Sasha ensures to get it done before Misha disappears, and Anos accepts her challenge. Anos tells her he'd keep his eyes closed until she's done. To be out of consideration for her reckless courage, she creates the magic circles, Zexus and Delt, the magic of her invention. Anos says that Zexus is a spell that sinks the sources, and Sasha immediately interrupts him that Misha only needs to control Zexus. Anos tells her that she doesn't intend to win from the get-go. Well, she replies that it's not like she can control magic circles this huge. Meanwhile, Anos controls it, and it means he wins the duel. Then, Sasha explains that Misha has always been there for her, but because Misha never existed, she was always alone. She has been doing research all the time, hoping there would be a magic to change that. She decides to give Misha the rest of her life. She tries it with Delt to transform Misha into the original, but she mentions that Misha has to reject him to activate it. Well, it doesn't work, and she falls to her knees, cries, and begs Misha to reject her so that she can save her. Misha tells her not to feel bad for her because she never existed in the first place. Sasha doesn't want Misha to disappear on her, she cries out. Misha calms her and promises to always be by her side. Misha faces Anos and tells him the second miracle has happened in her lifetime. Anos says the miracle has not happened yet. Then he reminds them of a question being asked during the aptitude test. Let's say you have a daughter with power but little in the way of Demon King aptitude, and a son with little power but immense Demon King aptitude. If both were on the brink of death, which one should be saved? and tells them his answer to it is that he'd save both of them. All he has to do is change the past. He says originally, both of them were two different demons, but their sources are about to become one. He says he's going to send their sources back in time, 15 years, using Rivide. If they fuse there, then they'll have been born as twins with their respective sources. Then, they'll be going back in time themselves. To help them, he gives Sasha a share of his magic power via guise, and all she has to do is fix her gaze on the origin with her demonic eyes. After that, there's one more key factor, which is that they have to believe in him, the Demon King's founding ancestor, and not some bogus pretender. They both say that they believe in him. All of a sudden, Lord Ivis lands on the scene and drives a huge sword into Anos' heart. He mentions to Anos that those sisters are to become the vessels for the founding ancestors through Dino Jixis. He also says that his master will then be awakened. Anos looks up and asks Ivis the other master he is expecting when he is already awake. Anos attacks him, tells him he knows Lord Ivis will be coming, and calls him a fool to think that crushing his heart would be enough to kill him. He draws out the sword and throws it against Lord Ivis' face. Then, they get to perform the Revide, and a god, Yugo Laya Ravias, the guardian god of time, comes barging over from the heavenly realm that controls time. The guardian god of time tells Anos that he shall be punished for disrupting the flow of time 
and he rewinds Lord Ivis. He grants him the power of the God of Time. He's ordered to eliminate Anos. Anos chants Geo Grays, but Lord Ivis stops time and dodges the fire attack. He claims that he's invincible now, and he tells that Anos' weakness is blatantly obvious. He throws a sword at them, but Anos blocks it with a magic barrier and then asks Lord Ivis if he has a reason for killing him, even if it means killing the vessel he struggled to create. Lord Ivis isn't interested in Anno's talks, he prefers they get to fight. He begins to hit and penetrate the magic barrier, and eventually has his way again in Anos's heart. He says Anos be swallowed up by eternal time and vanish. Then he laughs uncontrollably at foolish founding ancestors who cannot change the past. He keeps bluffing when Anos touches his shoulder and tells him he quite didn't forget him at all from all he said. Lord Ivis is shocked, but, well, killing Anos isn't enough to make him die. Lord Ivis quickly gets himself up in the air and says, Stop, Needle. Stop, Clock, to stop time. But it only affects Sasha and Misha. He tells Anos that no one would ever believe him. And then he keeps striking his swords against Anos, but it has no effect. Anos says that him being him is what it means to be the Demon King. He flings Lord Ivis away. He tells the sisters to walk behind him, and that their wishes shall come true and obliterate every injustice that stands in their way. Starting immediately, they swear that they believe and understand him, and it all starts to happen. Lord Ivis is in a mess as Anos is going to show him what it means to take on the Demon King in his demon castle. Anos wields a demonic sword. Everyone who's ever seen it has been wiped out so Lord Ivis is going to face the same fate. The Magic Sword of Destruction, Venusnor, the demonic sword of the founding ancestor that annihilates everything, says Anos. Anos slashes him with the demonic sword and his body is not healing. Anos tells him to carve it into his skull, along with his fear, to ensure that he'll never forget it. He splashes him repeatedly till he blows off. Anos calls him the Demon King, Anos Voldegoad. The Guardian God of Time curses him and tells him that Providence cannot contain me, and then he fades away completely. Anos snaps his fingers to resurrect his subordinate with whom he shared his blood, then Lord Ivis. Anos tells him that the magic sword of destruction, Venusner, has annihilated the sources of the demon and the guardian god, but it looks like there's still one more. Lord Ivis falls to his knees and asks for forgiveness from his venerable demon king, Anos Voldegoad. Anos then asks him what happened, but he can't because the majority of his memory is still gone. He says that it's most likely that he was murdered, and his source was fused and taken over. Anos returns his true memory that he knows of. They admit that it was someone working for Avos Dilhevia, who took over Lord Ivis's body. Anno says he's going to make the enemies believe that Lord Ivis died in his castle, while Lord Ivis investigates them, and he should start with the other seven Elder Demon Emperors, and he agrees. The two sisters appear back, and it's all over. The scepter vanishes, and Anno says they need to get there before nine to get a perfect score. Sasha asks why he cares about scores with all that he's capable of, and he tells them that he's changed the past several times, but he's never gotten a perfect score on a test. However, they find their way out, and Misha almost falls from being tired when her letter drops on the floor, but Sasha helps her up. Anos gladly picks up the letter because it's her good luck charm. Misha cries and says the people that raised at her are so kind, but she was scared to read the letter because she thought yesterday was her last day. Sasha holds her from behind. They both want each other to live. Sasha apologizes to Misha for telling her she hated her. Anos turns and says, peace isn't a bad thing, is it? He loves the good era and wishes that it's the world he'd created. Anos puts the lily pad ice ring on Misha's finger and wishes her a happy birthday. Sasha also wishes for her too. Then, Lord Anos wishes Sasha too, and she thanks him. Lord Anos laughs and asks her where all the momentum she had when she kissed him is. Misha is surprised to hear this, but she claims that it was just a kiss between friends, nothing else. He invites them to his parents' house to have a meal like the usual. It's a new day in class. Sasha and Misha are about their performance in the dungeon test, so they're expecting a perfect score when the dungeon test result finally comes out. Then, Miss Amelia enters the class to announce that a transfer student will be joining them tomorrow. The transfer student is a member of the Generation of Chaos, and a prodigy known as the Master of the Magic Sword. He's royalty. Miss Amelia warns those in white uniform not to forget their standing when they interact with him. Then she mentions that the Scepter Team Anos brought back during the dungeon exam the other day seems to have been stolen by an unknown party before they could appraise it. She says Team Anos will be awarded a score of 70 as a temporary measure until the culprit is found. Sasha disagrees with Miss Amelia that it's the Academy's fault that it got stolen, so the temporary score should be 100. One of the students says it could be Team Anos that stole it themselves so no one would find out it's fake since he's a misfit. Another student, Misa Iloruagu, asks Miss Amelia if the same measures would have been taken with royalty. 
She says it's like discriminating against them because they're hybrids. Miss Amelia tells her that Unitarian campaigns are prohibited on campus, so she should take her seat immediately, or else she gets punished. Anno says that all they have to do is smoke out the culprit. Then he moves close to a suspected student, drags out the scepter, and hands it over to Miss Amelia. He then whispers to Miss Amelia that she should do a better job when making a guy like that pilfer something. Miss Amelia announces that they'll be undergoing great magic sword training by Sir Gaios and Sir Edel of the Seven Elder Demon Emperors tomorrow. Misa finds Anos and his crew to thank him for standing up for her. Anos remembers Miss Amelia saying something about Unitarians, and Misa explains the purpose of the Unitarians, which is to unify the demon race as it ought to be regardless of whether one is royalty or hybrid. Then she asks if Anos would like to come see them, and she tells him that the Unitarians believe that he's the Demon King of Tyranny. She added that they have a long way to go to reach their goals, but they have many comrades in arms. Sir Melhais Boran of the Seven Elder Demon Emperors is one of them, says Misa. She says both Sasha and Misha could join the Unitarians too. Misa shows all around their majors, including the Union Tower, the headquarters for their Anos Fan Union. They decide to go into the headquarters for their Anos Fan Union, and all the members are surprised and happy to see Sir Anos. Sasha finds a book where she sees Sir Anos' naked art, and screams. Misa says they could call these items evidence for when the Fan Union falls under suspicion, but Anos tells her that the fact that they can't carry on openly is evidence of their lack of power. She shows a gift from her father that Sir Anos may have already caught on to before. Her father is a demon while her mother is a spirit, so Misa is a half-spirit, half-demon. Her mother passed away soon after Misa was born, and she's never met her father because of her father's royalty. A royal has to leave behind pure-blood descendants. If any other strain is introduced, even those relatives are excluded from royalty, meaning he can't let it be known that he has a hybrid daughter, but the only thing he sent Misa was her tenth birthday the magic sword. Her father is with the other half of the magic sword, so she believes that a day will come when royalty and hybrids can all join hands. All the members of the Unitarians want to join Team Anno's team. Sir Anno's requests he see them prove the depth of their resolve. All the students are put to the test, to pull out swords from the ground, as the magic sword tournament that determines Dilhade's top swordsman is coming up. Anyone who manages to pull out the swords will be trained in person by Gaios Anzem or Idol Anzeo. Anos confesses that it's only one sword that he can't pull out. During the mythical age, there was a holy sword wielded by a hero, a demonic instrument forged by a renowned human swordsmith, to annihilate Anos inhabited by a sword spirit and blessed by all of the gods. A sword pulls out of the ground and heads towards Anos, but he handles it and says, even if he couldn't pull that one out, he can pull this out. Gaio Sanzem congratulates Anos and decides to take him on. Idol Anzo asks if anyone has pulled out any. Immediately, the transfer student pulls out a sword, which most of the students are talking about. Idol Anzo recognizes him and tells him to show them how skilled he is instead of introducing himself, but he doesn't want to. Idol Anzio attempts to beat Cowardice out of the transfer students, thinking he's afraid to fight. The transfer student dodges his attempt and hits him in the back. The transfer student says he means he has no business winning. Anos smashes Gaios Anzem and responds to the transfer student that he wouldn't say that because it's not all that uncommon for one of the seven elder demon emperors to lose. Anos tells the transfer student those are fine sword skills, but he is holding back, and he answers that it's not as much as Anos was. In the class, the transfer student, despite his abilities, refuses to become a team leader as said by Miss Amelia, so he decides to join Team Anos. He introduces him to Lei Glanzudli and asks Anos if he can join his team. It suits him better to have a competent leader ordering him around, says Lei Glanzudli. Miss Amelia tells him not to forget Anos's symbol. Lei Glanzudli wonders what those aptitude tests are for if a demon like Anos ends up as a misfit. Then Miss Amelia cries out and says what Lei Glanzudli just said, amounts to criticism of the royalty. Then he apologizes and tells her to pretend like she never heard it. Anos finds it interesting. Leglanzudliai puts forward a hand and says, he looks forward to working with Anos. Anos didn't shake him but said, pass. Anos tells him to join any other team if he wants to have an easy time of it, but if he insists on becoming his subordinate, then he should show that he has the proper amount to resolve. Then, he asks if he should kneel and kiss his shoes. Leglanzudli is a gung-ho if he's so ready to take a kick to the face, says Anos. Anos asks Misha when the next team competition exam is and she says, tomorrow. Anos tells Misa and her mates to join Lei's team and to work together to challenge him. He says he'll allow them to become his subordinates if they can acquit themselves accordingly. Lei agrees and confesses that he wants to go up against Anos too. What a coincidence. The next day, the team competition exam between Team Anos and Team Lei begins. Lei turns to his members and tells them to all help out, although he may be a flaky leader. Lei confesses that Lei is not like most people, 
addressing them the way he does when they're in white uniforms. Lei claims that he's not a fan of any of that. He added that royalty is just so complicated, and he can't wrap his head around it. And besides, it makes him feel uncomfortable. He says that he keeps wondering if the founding ancestors say that royalty is so great. He also can't help feeling that his demon king of tyranny everyone talks about is someone else entirely. In Anos' team, Anos will take on Lei, Sasha will handle the other members, and Misha will build an ice castle. Misha builds them a castle and Sasha asks her when she has been able to build a complete castle this fast. She can't tell if it's the power of the lily pad ice ring, and Anos tells her it's part of it. Anos appears to Lei who has been waiting for his arrival, although he apologizes to him. Anos sees a blunt sword with Lei, and Lei says he lent Misa his magic sword. He added if they're linked by guys, he can make her the sword owner. Anos guess not. Anos sees an enormous object being manipulated by Gwyneth. Seems like Lei lends his members his magic power. Lei says he's not good with spells, and he's got all this extra magic power since he rarely has any use for them. Anos makes it clear to him that everything Lei has or has done still doesn't put them on equal footing. Anos picks up a piece of wood and says he will take Lei on with it. Anos tells Sasha to work with Misha and use the Geo Grays. She says just the two of them can't produce enough magic power, and Anos tells her to trust him. Lei tells him to stop chatting, but Anos tells him to drill the sword into him if he wants to shut him up. Misha calls Sasha and tells her to discharge a three-dimensional magic circle, activate siege spell, link magical lines, commence delivery of magic power, annihilation mortal, hellfire mortar, release all magic power gates, excitation of magic circle, complete, hellfire destruction baragi, requesting transfer of Activayan spell. Sasha accepts and chants Geograza to release the fire. The fire hits the enormous object and it falls on the ground. They couldn't believe that their power was this potent, and then they remembered Anos told them to ask their sources, which amplified their power. Misa suddenly appears at Sasha's back and thinks she got her but Sasha is aware to fight back. Misa slashes Sasha in the hand and Sasha stands to face her really with her phoenix robe. The enormous object stands back on its feet, and then Misha appears on the scene to help her sister. Sasha never thought she'd see the day when she and her sister would join hands together to fight their common enemy. They plan to show Misa and other members the secret techniques of the Necrons. Misa and her members control the enormous object and attempt to hit Misha and Sasha. Misha and Sasha chant Fire Magic Gresde, Ice Magic Shade, Fusion Magic Jai Glade, and they hit Misa and her crew. They are happy that they're pretty much in sync for the first time. While Anos and Lei fight, the whole mountain begins to get blown away. The ladies in both teams are scared, and even the river dries up. Anos says they shouldn't bother themselves because everything will go back to normal overnight. At the end of the fight, Anos gets him, but he's able to slash Anos's weapon in two, so Anos considers it a loss for him. Lei asks if he could say something strange, and Anos tells him to go ahead. Lei says that the whole time they were crossing swords, he had this feeling that this wasn't the first time he'd meet Anos. Anos tells him they might have met 2,000 years ago, besides, he knows a man who looks a lot like Lei. He asks Lei if he'd believe it if he told him that he was the Demon King of Tyranny. Lei isn't sure, but it wouldn't surprise him. He then asks Anos if it means that he won't be able to join his team since he lost to him. Anos puts forward his hand and tells him it's Anos, no need for honorifics. Lei shakes him and stands up, but he says he will beat Anos next time. Anos tells him that he's not going to snap his sword next time. Anos got new subordinates to his team, Lei and Misa, so he invites them to his parents' house as usual to have mushroom grates, which his mom prepares. Anos's mom is all over his son for winning yet another game. Anos accepts Misa as one of his subordinates because of her potential. The spell she used in the battle was Linion's signature move, the Great Spirit of Water. Misa is linked to her in some way, but it will be intriguing to see if Misa can unleash her true worth. Misa gratefully thanks Anos. Anos's father praises Anos for doing great and making new friends at school, and he says Anos will make a fine demon lord someday. Anos's mother tells them that she needs to do some studying, so she visits the castle of the Midhaz demon lord, Sir Elio Ludowell, who happens to be Miss Amelia's father. Anos's mother tells Anos that she's going to cheer him on 100% so that his dream will come true. And then his father cheers that he will be giving more than 100%. Lei eats the meal and he likes it. Lei and Misa step out to get some air while others are inside talking, listening to fascinating stories about before and after Anos was born. Anos's father says things got a little dicey before Anos was born. Anos almost died inside his mother's womb. Her mother prayed with all her might when that happened. Her mother promised to deliver herself to raise him so long as he could be born, no matter what kind of child he was. Eventually, 
all her prayers were answered. His father also says Anos may be a little bit different from other kids, but none of that matters to them because their Anos is alive and well. Misa thanks Lei for what he did for her earlier that day, and she's able to join Sir Anos's team. Lei says he should have avoided Anos and attacked the two Necrons because if he'd defeated at least one of them, maybe the girls in the fan union could have joined the team too. Lei apologizes for putting his own emotions before their team's victory. Misa is surprised by the way Lei talks to her, a hybrid, not just during the test but even now. Lei doesn't seem to care about royalty or hybrids, and all he wants to focus on is his sword. Misa suggests that people like Lei might be optimal Unitarians, since their own goal is not to discriminate. Lei says she shouldn't talk him up like that. He asks if Misa ever feels rundown or anything, being a half-spirit, half-demon. And she replies yes, there are days she doesn't feel well, but she's fine. She asks her why he asked. And he says he heard that half-spirit, half-demons don't live long. Also, there are no half-spirit, half-demons who remain alive and kicking after using spirit magic. Then he admits that Misa must be something special. Well, Misa is not so sure of herself. They head back inside to meet others. On the next day in class, Miss Amelia reminds the class about the upcoming Magic Sword tournament and announces the two students who have been selected from their class, Lei Glanzudli and Anos Vildigode. She tells them to equip themselves with a Magic Sword for the tournament. Lei meets with Anos to tell him that their rematch seems to be sooner than thought, but Anos tells him that the last thing the royalty wants is for a hybrid like him to win the Magic Sword tournament. He wonders why they'd pick him. There seems to be some kind of ulterior motive behind it. Misa comes to the scene to tell Sir Anos that Sir Melhais Boran of the Seven Elder Demon Emperors is here. Sir Melhais Boran sees Anos, tears run down his face, and he immediately falls to his knees and bows to Anos. He says he has waited so long for Anos to be resurrected. He calls him his master. Anos asks him if he remembers him. Sir Melhais is ashamed to tell his master that someone caught him off guard and erased his memories. That seems to be the same thing being done to Ivis. Sir Melhais tells Anos his source never forgot about him. If that much he's certain, now that he's seeing him in the flesh. Anos asks him how much he knows. He explains that it happened 2,000 years ago, right after Anos sacrificed himself to build the wall. The next thing he knew, he was in the Forest of Great Spirit Aharthurn, robbed of his memories. Presumably, he'd gone there to flee his unknown attackers. He climbed over the wall, separating Dilhade and a Hearthurn, but it took him 100 years to restore enough magic power to go back over the wall to Dilhad. And by the time he returned here, the name of the Demon King of Tyranny had changed. The new name is Avos Dilhavia. Anos asks Sir Melhais if he has any idea what Avos Dilhavia is plotting, but he says nothing in particular that he knows. Anos says the person who chose him to compete in the Magic Sword Tournament is in Delsgade, so he asks Sir Melhais if he knows why would do that. Sir Melhais guesses that the royal supremacists are behind that one. Misa says the royalist. Sir Melhais tells Sir Anos that he is the Unitarian's light of hope, and the enemies must be intent on defeating him to crush that hope. Sir Melhais then speaks with all due respect. He begs Anos to consider dropping out of the Magic Sword Tournament. If he refuses to take their bait, Avos Dilhevia might give himself away. Sir Anos says he'd think about it. Anos gets home and Misha has prepared mushroom grates. Misha confesses his mom showed her how. Anos's mom says Misha mentioned that she wanted to cook a delicious meal for him, so she invited her to drop by when she had time. While eating, his mother says she hears that Anos is taking part in the Magic Sword Tournament. She also says Miss Amelia came visiting too. Anos asks her if that's only what she told her. His mother says yes, she also said the whole academy would throw its support behind him. Anos can tell now that Miss Amelia wants him to take part in the tournament. His mother asks if they should make him a big banner, but Anos says he doesn't know if he's competing or not. In her mother's opinion, if her son performs well in the tournament, it will give him a better chance of becoming the Demon Lord. Misha added that he needs a good track record to become the Demon Lord. Anos agrees, but he says he'd need a good magic sword. His mother tells him not to worry about the sword. His dad heard about the tournament, and he's probably up to something, but his mother doesn't want to say it, so she closes up the conversation and tells them to eat before it gets cold. Misha feeds Anos the mushroom grate and she cooked. Anos tastes it and commends her. Anos's mother tells them to bring Sasha when next they're coming, but Misha answers that Sasha's been busy with the magic sword tournament. Anos's mother suggests that they have an after-party with everyone when the tournament's over. Anos asks Misha if she'd like him to thank her for the dinner, but Misha says she's the one who should be thanking him. He asks her if there's something she desires. She picks an outing, an excursion. Anos says they'll do it tomorrow. Anos says there's somewhere he'd like to go as well. They manage to find their way to where Misha would love to visit, Magic Model Shop, homeland of the Dragon of Creation. They enter the shop, and a woman sees Misha and asks her if she'd be making something today. The woman tells her that she's found a buyer for the one Misha made the other day. 
Anno sees one and asks if it is a magic model. Misha says the smaller and more precise one can make it, the better. The woman tells them to make themselves at home in her workshop. Misha and Anos enter the magic model workshop. Misha performs her magic there, and Anos asks her if this is what she likes to do. She answers yes that it's a souvenir for Sasha. She then asks Anos if he wants to try it. Anos tells her that if he does it, it will produce a one-of-a-kind masterpiece. Misha is so ready to see it. Anos did a whole down stuff, and the woman comes back from where she went to, to see the beautiful work they've made. She's so happy to see it. The woman faces Anos and tells him to allow her to take it off his hands, and she's ready as much as they want. They can even have the whole shop. Anos apologizes that he has another thing he wants to use it for. The woman says she'd be waiting for them. Misha likes it, and to make it even better, Anos changes it into a ring with the whole town inside it, so that Misha can get to look at it whenever she wants to. She thanks him. She becomes moody, and Anos asks her what the problem is. Misha tells him that Anos is always helping her out. He became his friend, and he gives her a lot of memories. She wants to pay back, but Anos doesn't need her since he can do everything. Anos disagrees and tells her that she has good eyes and is also adept at creation magic. He says she might surpass him one day strictly in those two areas. He confesses that the only thing he has that is superior to anyone in this world is the power to destroy something, but Misha's creation magic is the opposite of his. He tells her that if she wants to help him, she should get closer to the abyss of her magic. Then she promises to get stronger. They see a cat cafe, Silvervine restaurant, in front of them. Anos turns Ivis into a cat to have him look into Melhais. Cat says Unitarians are not led by Melhais, but rather by someone pulling the strings behind the scenes. But he hasn't been able to uncover that person yet, and it seems like none of the Unitarians even know his identity. The cat also discovered that there was one more person here in Midhaze of an unknown identity. This person is affiliated with the Log North Magic Clinic. The clinic is built by Demon Lord Elio of Midhaze, but he's just a ceremonial figurehead. There seems to be someone else behind the scenes and no amount of digging can unmask him. The cat says he doesn't have enough information to link those two yet. Anos tells the animal to keep looking into Melhaze as well as the Magic Sword Tournament. Anos and Misha find Lognorth Magic Clinic, the top clinic in Dilhade. Anos says there's nothing particularly suspicious about the clinic. They meet Lei in the building, and he asks them what they're doing here. Well, they say that they're just passing by. Lei tells them that he's here to visit his mother. Anos tells him if there's nothing the doctors can do for her, he can take care of it, regardless of how intense or critical it may be. Lei thanks him and sets to leave, when Anos tells him that he might not take part in the Magic Sword tournament. Lei tells him that they'll settle the score another time if they don't get to fight in the Magic Sword tournament, and then he leaves. Misha says, Lei seems a little different than usual. Anos says, he'll have Ivis look into him too. Finally, the Magic Sword tournament commences today, and there are a lot of people hurrying here and there. The cat arrives to give Anos an update as usual. The cat says that Melhais has nothing to do with today's Magic Sword tournament, but Gaios and Idor of the Seven Elder Demon Emperors seem to be involved behind the scenes. The cat added that they intend to have Anos fall into some kind of trap they've set up. Anos asks about Lei, and the cat says it has checked the Log North Magic Clinic records. Lei's mother is critically ill and close to death. She suffers from spirit disease. Anos knew there was nothing like spirit disease in the past 2,000 years ago. Evis hasn't heard of it either, but it seems to be an extremely rare disease. Evis asks Sir Anos if he's planning to withdraw from the Magic Sword tournament, and Anos says it's not a bad way to find out how Avos Dilhevia would react. The first round of the Magic Sword tournament will begin with Krut Ludowell of the Lognorth Magic Sword Association, the defending champion and most powerful swordsman in Dilhade, and Anos Voldegoad of the Demon King Academy Delshud. Anos is nowhere to be found, but his opponent is ready on stage waiting for him. The crowd starts to say a lot of rumors here and there. Amos is among the crowd but can't take in everything she's hearing, so she talks at the top of her voice. She tells them that her son can become the Demon Lord, and she also says that her son is powerful, good-looking, and an amazing boy. She tells them not to laugh at her child's dream, so that Anos can hear her voice. Then, his dad comes to the scene to give him a magic sword that he forged himself from adamantine steel. He sees that his dad is hurt, and his dad tells him that the adamantine steel was on top of a cliff. It's just a scratch. His dad tells him that if he can win, it will mean that even hybrids can become the Demon Lord. Anos couldn't believe he was erring on the side of caution, over a crowd who refused to show himself. He vows that he will find his way through any trap they've set for him. Anos says all he wants now is to see his mom and dad look overjoyed. He surprises everyone with his presence. Krut Ludawil tells him he's starting to think Anos will run off, hero of Unitarians. Anos apologizes for wasting his time. Anos brings out the sword and sets to finish his opponent off in one minute. First round. Let match number one begin. 
Lei is shown sitting all alone in the upper room. First round, let match number one begin. The ladies in the Unitarian start to sing Sir Anos' fight song, chorus number two. Kroot Ludowell starts to make moves, but Anos dodges every single move. Kroot uses secret move, Waterfang linked demon thrust. Anos cuts it off in a single slash. Anos slashes both Kurt and his sword repeatedly. He knocks down at exactly one minute. Anos Voldegod is announced as the winner, and his parents and others praise him. Crude, on the other hand, wonders how a lowly sword like that could bring down. Anos tells him that there's something other than magic power in a sword forged so lovingly by a true craftsman. Then, he tells him not to underestimate his dad's sword. Misa commends Sir Anos for his performance, but Anos tells her it's just the first round. Just then, he watches the whole fight of match number two in which Lei Glanzudli of the Lognorth Magic Sword Association is announced as the winner. Anos and Misa seem confused when they hear Lognorth. They know him to be a royalist organization. Lei comes into the room where he meets Anos and Misa, but then he says he'd appreciate it if they keep their questions to themselves. Well, Anos doesn't mind doing that. Misa asks him why he joins the Lognorth Magic Sword Association, thinking the royalists are making some kind of pitch to him. Lei says the royalists did, like, enough money to live off for the rest of my life plus the role of Demon Lord. Misa finds it hard to believe that Lei will go for something like that. Lei makes it clear to them that he's a royalist now, and he can't be friends with them anymore. He's about to open the door when he tells Anos that he forgot to tell him that he's going to kill him. Anos tells him to come prepared to die. He looks at Anos and says, it's not much of a threat. He says that he's always risked his life for everything, and then Anos says he can put Lei's resolve to the test. Lei brings out his sword to slash Anos, but he blocks with his bare arm and grabs Lei's heart tightly. They both lose blood in the sight of contact. Misa is scared, and he calls both names. Lei says he is looking to slice off Anos's head and arms and all, while Anos says he was looking to crush Lei's heart between his fingers. Anos says Lei's body is quite durable. They both look forward to competing in the final. Lei leaves, and Anos tells Misa that Lei seems to be wearing a collar around his neck, and he can sense the presence of magical gear inside his body. Most likely it's a contractual magic sword, which is designed to destroy his source under certain conditions. Anos heals his arm and says, Lei might be a hostage since he won't appeal to him directly for help. Anos Voldegoad wins his second fight, and that has set through to the final. Some random men are seen saying, Lei is advancing and most likely to take care of Anos. Anos's parents and the Unitarian ladies congratulate Sir Anos on reaching the finals. Anos's father leaves for work and promises to come to cheer Anos up the next day. Anos's mother asks if she can help Anos hold the sword because he has to get some rest for his next fight and a lady says he wouldn't be allowed to use another word under the rules of the tournament. He gives his sword to his mom to keep for him, and the Unitarian ladies say they'd accompany her. Anos and Misa arrive at where Lei's mom's body is lying. She seems to have been affected with spirit disease, so her magic power is diminishing, and his source is getting sparse. Anos looks through her body and notices the effect looks like the ravages of old age. Lei's mom is half spirit, half demon, just like Misa. Misa says Lei is royal, so his mom should be a pure blood demon, but Anno says it could be that he wasn't raised by his biological parents, so the spirit disease could be looked at as something related to half-spirit, half-demon. A few moments later, she opens her eyes and recognizes that she's been conscious all the time. She says Lei talked about him in the room and that he'd make a new friend. Then, Anos asks her if she knows about the contractual magic sword embedded inside Lei, and she replies yes, then says, Lei is at the beck and call of the royalists in return for getting treatment for her. Anos tells her that Lei will no longer be shackled if he heals her. Anos asks her to say everything she knows about her spirit disease, and she explains thus, Spirits are made up of one's emotions, desires, rumors, and traditions, and their manifestations of such things, but a half-spirit, half-demon source tradition is a weak and newborn rumor. Anos says the rumor can be easily extinguished each time reducing more and more of her source, so all he has to do is pass down the tradition. But she doesn't seem to know her tradition. She says she's feeling a bit stronger today because she can't remember how long it's been since she talked. Well, she tells Anos that Lei has always loved swordplay, and he swings his sword whenever he has a moment to spare, but he always seemed so bored. He has been feeling lonelier since she collapsed, but he came home to tell her he lost a fight and he looked thrilled talking about it. She says Lei desires to fight Anos. She begs Anos to free Lei and not to allow him to swing a cowardly sword. 
Anos asks her if she's sure about it because she'd end up perishing. She says she has no desire to live if it means standing in her child's way. Misa begs Anos to help Lei's mom, but it would be difficult to heal her completely if he doesn't know what her tradition is. Anos says spirits and demons have different sources. Misa suggests that Anos should link their sources since they're of the same kind. They begin with it. Miss Amelia meets Anos's mom and the ladies at their home, and tells them that the rule states that the steering committee is supposed to hold on to the contestants' swords, just for the finals. But none of the ladies can relate as they've not heard that before. Also, Anos's mother refuses to let go of the sword to her. She'd rather take it to the steering committee herself. Miss Amelia drags the sword with her, but she won't let go, and then she punishes them all with her magic. Anos's mother asks her why she'd do such a thing to her students. She says hybrids are just thieves, eavesdropping on her classes. Anos's mother asks her why she wants the sword, and she answers that she can never forgive Anos after humiliating the pure blood Ludowell family. Anos's mother tells her that stealing Anos's sword so he won't compete is wrong. The ladies sing their usual farewell song, and they strive hard to protect Anos's mother and the sword from wicked Miss Amelia, but they can't. She burns them alive. She wants to try the same thing on Anos's mother, but Anos arrives at the right time to handle it. Miss Amelia starts bluffing, and Anos holds her still to shut her up. He heals the ladies and his mom. He thanks the ladies for holding up till he comes back, and then he turns to Miss Amelia. He grabs her in the neck and teleports her to somewhere where he has a sword in her from behind, so a fatal wound has been inflicted on her. Anos gives her a chance to live only when she acknowledges him as the demon king of tyranny and begs for her life, but she bluffs again. He tortures her until she says the word, but she doesn't mean, so he kills her, then reborns her as a hybrid. She tries to kill herself, but he's placed a curse on her that no matter how many times she dies, she'll always come back to life as a hybrid. He tells her to enjoy her new world because she might realize how biased her views were before. Lei comes to check up on his sick mother when he sees Misa doing some stuff. He walks gently and puts a knife towards her neck to ask her what's doing. She explains to him the reason they're doing this. He asks her if Anos knows about it, but she says no. Lei tells her not to get caught up in meaningless emotion. She joined the Unitarians so she could save many hybrids, so she'll have to put her life on the line for real someday. She claims that the day is already here because she wants to save Lei's mother from suffering at the moment. He thanked her and shook her with the knife. His mother finally wakes up and calls his name. He runs towards his mother and promises her he's going to win. His mother says she'd always be by his side and tells him to be himself and live the way he wants to. Then, she died. He leaves the room and Anos teleports to the room and watches Lei through the window as he walks away. The Dilhade Magic Sword Tournament final stage is finally here, and the crowds are seated to experience the final stage of the tournament, a fight between Lei and Anos. Some people watch it on TV, a fight between Lei and Anos. The crowds share their favorites. Special rules are being announced in which a bracelet is put in each player's left hand. It will count as a loss if these bracelets get destroyed. Anos's bracelet is set to exacerbate Lei's mother's spirit disease and extinguish her the moment the magic power being drained by that spirit drain ring is depleted. And if Lei is defeated, his source will be wiped out by the contractual magic sword. After the rules have been read out to both players, the match begins. They begin to show their various sword skills. Lei can't believe Anos is fighting despite his magic power being drained, but Anos tells him that it's not hindering him any less, so he shouldn't hold back. Lei starts to spit out the royalist's plan, which is for him to buy time because the odds get better for him the longer it goes, but he activates the contractual magic sword. He believes he's going to die. He can't heal his mom, and there is no reason why Anos should go down with him. Then, he challenges Anos. Anos believes there's no need to think about anything anymore after everything Lay's said. Anos says the fight is about him and Lay now, not about Unitarians, royalties, or Lay's mother. They continue the fight which becomes too intense and fast. Lay cuts off Anos's left arm, while Anos has his sword through Lay's heart. Lay falls to his knees while he says he had a good time with him. All of a sudden, the stage is driven down to a dimensional prison. Then, a voice says, I have waited so many years for this moment. Anos could tell that it was Melhais that is one who planted the contractual magic sword inside Lei, and the one who selected him for the magic sword tournament. Then, he appears and laughs, thinking he can get rid of Anos for good after a long time and claim victory. He thinks the spirit drain more than half of Anos's magic power. Also, he says the arm sliced off by Lei won't get healed anytime soon. Melhis comes along with Gaios and Idol to fight Anos, meaning that Anos is up against three of the seven elder demon emperors. Now, it seems like Anos and Lei are together in this game, and it looks like the three of the seven elder demon emperors give themselves away in front of them. 
Lei uses his sword to tear up both Gaios and Idol, and Anos immediately stands them still with the Rivide spell. Melhais is surprised to see Lei alive because he thought his source had been wiped out. Anos tells Melhais to peer closer into the abyss. He does and realizes that the contractual magic sword is gone. According to Lei, Anos' last strike on him breaks the contractual magic sword. Melhais has no idea that both of them are conspiring. Lei believes in Anos because he knows he'll transcend everything, although he went all out against him. To prove to them that he still wins, he shows them a gate where he holds Lei's mom captive. Then, he proposes a trade that he'd treat Lei's mom if he allied with him. Anos dares him to go ahead and kill the woman. Lei distracts him so he can enter the gate before he closes the gate. Melhais comes prepared for the fight. He attacks Anos with walls he used 2,000 years ago to divide the world when he sacrificed himself. But Anos blocks it, the walls. Absorb the magic power supplied to the spirit drain ring. Melhais hides in an absolute space where only he can enter, and he believes he'd win as long as he remains in the space he created. Melhais attempts to attack Lei, but Anos creates an anti-demonic spell to protect him from being by the walls. Anos is overusing his power, so he tells Lei to do something about it. Lei tells Anos to create a powerful sword, using the magic power for his anti-demonic spell. Lei fights the walls with the powerful sword, but he's nowhere near the walls. As he gets knocked down, even the sword gets broken. He assumes he can't find the walls, but his mother lends him a hand, which he uses to fight down the walls, and he could slash through the space where Melhis hides. His mother praises him and fades into the air. While Melhis bluffs, Anos finds his way into the absolute space and holds Melhis by his shoulder with his arm perfectly fixed back to its position. Melhis, who still has other options, captures Anos in a consummate spell, but Anos bursts out through the spell. Melhis repeats it, but to no effect. Anos uses Venus door to create a magic sword of destruction with the help of the spirit drain ring and the walls, and his destruction source is given a rude awakening which helps him regain the magic power he had before he was reincarnated. Anos slashes Melhase when he attempts to retreat and he falls to the ground. He thought he dodged it, but magic sword of destruction annihilates all laws. Melhase creates several gates to release gates. Beno Levun, but all do not affect Anos. Anos stabs Melhais in his forehead and reverses his senses so he recognizes him. He comes back to life with his senses and recognizes him as Sir Anos. Out of the dimension prison, back to the fighting stage, Melhais asks for forgiveness from his master and confesses that he was taken by surprise. Then, he explains how he was assaulted and manipulated by an unknown entity after he met with Anos. Anos orders him to summon Gaios and Idol to the stage. Anno says that the sources of Gaios and Idol have been fused and taken over, and the sources are most likely working for Avos Dilhavia. He tends to resurrect them, but an attack from an unknown man breaks the sources of Gaios and Idol. Anos asks the unknown man if he is Avos Dilhavia, but the unknown man says nothing and he leaves. Anos tells Melhais to revive Gaios and Idol. After the stage clears, the crowd can see Anos with his sword and Lei lying on the ground, also his magic sword has been broken. Anos Voldgod is announced as the winner of the Dilhade Magic Sword Tournament, and people hail and praise him. People ask him to tell them how he wins and how it feels to be a winner. Anos says he can win because of the sword his father gave him. He added that his dad forged the sword with all the love in his heart to make it compete and contain as much power as any magic sword. He directs all praise to the sword and his dad tears of joy ran down his father's face. Then, he resurrects Lei and uses an Ingol spell to resurrect Lei's mother. They both embrace each other. However, Anos can revive Sheila because he can trace down her tradition. Anos has presented a commemorative gift with Sasha as the gift presenter. Anos requests, she commends him well, and she does commend him with a kiss on his cheek, which got everyone off guard. It was quite an entertaining tournament, says Sir Anos. 2,000 years ago, Anos Voldegode alone visited Hero Kanan's town, Gyrodite, to discuss how to put an end to the war between humans and demons. Anos asks Kanan what exactly he wants. He's about to speak out when Jerga runs as his speed peaks to attack Anos, to avenge his family who have been killed by the demons, as well as humans. He ended up being killed by Anos. Anos, on the other hand, claims that his mother was killed by humans. Anos tells Kanon to find him in his castle, Delsgade, when he's ready to consider his requests to end the war. Then, he leaves. Kanon runs towards Jerga to help him. Jerga tells Kanon to find every way to defeat Anos because he has cost the human race a lot, and there's no way they can coexist. Sasha is seen walking a path wishing a cure for oversleeping exists at the same wondering why Misha didn't wake her up. Anos and Masha, who are coming from Anos's house to have lunch, meet her on the road. Anos' mother was teaching her how to make lunch, 
Sasha asks why she didn't inform her when she was going to Anos' house, and she answers that she tried to wake her up but she wouldn't stand up. Anos tells her that he'll wake her up next time if she'd like to come over. While they talk, Lei and Misa meet them there. In the class, a woman named Manu Historia addresses herself as the homeroom teacher for Year 3 Class 1, and she'd be taking over the class temporarily for Miss Amelia. The class murmurs a bit, wondering if Miss Amelia has quit teaching. Miss Manu announced their upcoming schedule, which is that they'd be holding inter-academy classes in three weeks, and the school will be represented by the third year. The venue will be Azacian's Hero Academy Arklaniska in the human realm, because there are members of the Generation of Chaos, the first year class. A student asks why they're going to the human realm despite the fact they don't interact that often with them. Miss Menu says the plans to hold the inter-academy class have been in the works for a while. Another student asks what Hero Academy is, but Miss Mano says they won't be learning about heroes until the third year. She explains what heroes is briefly, and she asks the class if anyone knows what they call the hero's troop magic, which is said to be similar to the demon's guise. Enos signifies and says, Asla, and under the spell, the subordinates share their magic power with their leader, but that it's not enough to unleash Asla's true value. He added that Guy's defends castles while Asla was developed to attack and destroy castles. Miss Manu commends him and tells him to make sure to do his homework, because there will be a Guy's versus Asla exam during the inter-academy classes. The Unitarian ladies praise him. Miss Manu could tell that Anos knows a lot about heroes. Anos claims that he did see more than his fill of them back in the day. After the class, Anos keeps wondering if the people forget about heroes considering that the world is now at peace. Then, Sasha suggests they go to study hall for the rest of the day. Anos trains them to fight him so he can point out what they need to work on to hold their ground while fighting enemies. He tells them he knew a hero who was so powerful and didn't seem human but he couldn't tell if he's been reincarnated into their area. He tells them that their opponents in the exam will be those inheriting the names of the heroes, so they'd better get ready for what's against them. This motivates his crew to want to try their best again. And that's definitely what Anos likes to hear. Mahes reports to Anos that he was able to successfully resurrect Gaios and Idol, but their sources seem to have been taken over by someone 2,000 years ago. The remaining of the seven Elder Demon Emperors are yet to be found, but they're most likely to have been taken over by Avos Delhevia. Anos asks Melhais why he's the only one who wasn't taken, and he tells them they didn't have enough trusted subordinates to fuse with him. Anos claims that he might be a trap to make them think that's what happened. Mahias urges Anos to exercise the utmost caution during the inter-academy classes, because he's had his suspicions for a while. Anos asks him why it was built in the first place. Melhais says it was built in the first place to nurture those who could contribute to the country's expansion, but there seems to be an elite class for reincarnated heroes. He says hero used to mean a great war hero, but they gather and train only resurrected heroes now that the world is at peace. There are reasons behind it that they do not know. Anos shows Lei his swords and tells him to pick whatever he likes. Lei apologizes that he won't settle down without a sword. Lei picks the unique sword Sigshesta, which can transform at will, heart and soul. Lei tries the Sigshesta blade on a statue but it's blunt, meaning that one has to focus with their heart for it to slash anything. Lei reminds Anos of his right-hand man 2,000 years ago, who'd mastered every sword in existence. He was the only one who could control Sigshesta blade at will. Lei says he gets the sense that he used to live in another era, but he doesn't remember anything. Then he asks if Anos and his right-hand man promised to meet again. Anos says that he did. Lei insists he'd take the unique sword Sigshesta. A whispering bird directs the students to the capital of Ajeshion, Gyrodite, for the inter-academy classes, and it's going to take them 10 days to get there. Students who fail to reach Gyrodite within the stipulated time won't be eligible to take part. The journey begins, but Anos uses his magic to get himself and his crew to Gyrodite in the blink of an eye. He tells them that he's been here before. Lei wants to use the opportunity of the time they have to explore the city. Misa says she will contact the fan union from their lodgings. Misha says she'd go with Misa, while Sasha tags along with Anos. Sasha finds Azishion almost the same as Dilhade. Anos sees some happy kids, and he admits that the Garudite is certainly peaceful. Anos wants to get a look at the Hero Academy, and Sasha warns him not to cause any uproars because they have the Inter-Academy classes ahead of them. Anos claims that he has common sense, and Sasha guesses not after he tried killing them over and over during study hall. He commends Sasha for not having succumbed. He says she's worthy of having the same demonic eyes as himself. 
Sasha says she's not falling for his compliments. He tells her that he wasn't lying when he told her before how beautiful her demonic eyes were. Her eyes turn, and everywhere begins to shake, and the people are exclaiming. Anos's eyes turn, and he tells her to look into his eyes. Upon looking, she says, beautiful, and Anos tells her her eyes are even more beautiful, so serene and innocent. Her eyes turn back and the shaking stops. Anos tells her to promise that you'll protect everyone with her own eyes in his stead, if his eyes are ever exposed to an unreachable danger. Sasha asks if he'd stop treating her like a child, if she fulfilled the promise. Anos agrees, and they make a deal. Anos and Sasha find their way to Hero Academy Arklaniska. Anos opens the gate, and they enter. A lady walks up to them from behind and tells them that Hero Academy is off-limits to outsiders. Anos tells her that they just arrived from Dilhade. She seems fascinated and asks if they're from the Demon Academy, and they answer yes. She introduced herself as Eleanor Bianca, a third year at the Hero Academy, and they did introduce themselves too. She asks them what they're doing at the Hero Academy, because it's not yet the time for inter-academy classes. Ano says he's intrigued by the hero legends. She tells them to come with her as they'll be safe as long as they're with her. She tells them about her academy, and they see a picture of Hero Canon. She shows them where books on magic from all over Azishion are gathered. She recommends a book about the legend of Hero Canon defeating the Demon King of Tyranny for them, if they want to learn about heroes. Sasha asks her why they all believe that Hero Canon defeated the Demon King of Tyranny. Well, she says it's a fact. Sasha asks her who built the walls that divided the world into four areas 2,000 years ago, and she says that they were built by Hero Kanan to protect humans from the remnants of the demon race. Sasha yells at her and says they were built by the Demon King of Tyranny at the cost of his life to achieve peace. Anos calms her and tells her they have to let them believe that Hero Kanan killed the Demon King of Tyranny, or the humans from back then can never rest easy. Eleanor apologizes for saying it wrong. Anos asks her if she knows the name of the Demon King of Tyranny, and she answers Avos Dilhevia. Anos is surprised to know that they believe the same thing too. He asks Eleanor if she knows where the elite class for reincarnated heroes is. Eleanor knows it to be Jirga Kanan, and she takes them there. Anos asks if Hero Kanan is among them, and she says there are four reincarnations of Kanan. Anos explains to Sasha that Hero Kanan had seven sources a power he acquired to rise against demons. He can resurrect the other six if one source remains. Anos thinks each of them might have been reincarnated into different bodies. Anos asks Eleanor what the four say about the history of the heroes. Anos says they should be able to dispute this country's flawed history if they have Kanon's memories. A guy named Ledriano Kanon Azashen, the reincarnation of hero Kanon's first heart, and a member of the elite class, Jerga Kanon, comes in and says, he finds it unlikely that the Demon King, after running the gamut of tyranny, would build a wall to protect humans. He says Anos just can't accept defeat because of his blind worship of his founding ancestors. Another guy named Laos Kanan Jilfor, the reincarnation of Hero Kanan's third heart and a Jirga Kanan member comes to the scene. Anos says he doubts that both of them are Kanan's reincarnation. He says Kanan has only one true source while the rest are duds. They say they'd be happy to show him by flexing their hero muscles a bit instead of greeting. Anos, on the other hand, would love them to enlighten him. Laos Kanan tells Anos not to blink and he throws a magic blow, but Anos blinks to stop both the blow and Laos Kanan. Ledriano Kanan tells Laos Kanan to accept his loss. He apologizes to Anos for Laos Kanan's rudeness. He then asks for Anos's name. Anos is introduced as Anos Voldegode, then he and Sasha leave the scene, and Eleanor follows. Eleanor apologizes to Anos but admits that Anos is strong. Anos says it wouldn't have ended like that if he'd been up against the real canon. Sasha whispers in his ear that he still overdid it. Eleanor asks if Anos was reincarnated too, because she keeps wondering how he gets to know so much history about hero canon. Anos says yes, that they made an agreement before he was reincarnated and he is hoping to get the chance to see him. Eleanor tells Anos that the hero canon he's looking for is gone, because he was murdered 2,000 years ago. She added that he's not the hero he used to be anymore even with his source, so Anos will only get disappointed if he keeps looking for him. Then, he asks who murdered him, and she answers that it was a human. Some students manage to find their way to Gyrodite, and they are awarded an A for their effort. One of the students looks up and sees Anos and his crew entering the building. He's surprised, so he asks Miss Manu when they get there. Miss Manu says Anos and his crew have been in the city since 10 days ago, the day the students set out. While they walk into the building, Eleanor sees Anos, but Anos doesn't realize she's the one walking right in front of them, although Misha notices her face when she looks back. The set of canon reincarnations is seen upstairs, looking at Anos through a window. A third-year student, Revest Aini, addresses Anos as misfit, and asks him how he cheats 
to get to Gyrodite, and Anos tells him not to feel bad because he hears Rivest made it in two days. Then, Rivest quickly apologizes for his unfounded suspicions. He says he doesn't take Anos as the Demon King of Tyranny, which he calls himself, and he walks away. On the first day of the Inter-Academy classes, the headmaster of the Hero Academy, as well as one in charge of the elite Jirga Cannon class, Diego Cannon Ijaisika, welcomes the Demon King Academy students. They start with a bit of recreation, in which a representative from each academy is called out to demonstrate some magic using the objects on the table. Ledriano, the Hero Academy's representative, and Rivest Aini, the top-ranked third-year representative of the Demon King Academy, are called out. The recreation begins with Ledriano using Hero Magic. Lee hid to cast an object into a potion and increase its efficacy in the case of a sword, using the sword to break down a human object. Rivest attempts to use demonization magic, Nedra, on a mouse in a cage, but it has no effect. Ledriano laughs and asks if that is the best the top-ranked third-year student at the Demon King Academy can do. The headmaster tells Ledriano not to laugh. It could be that Rivest is nervous. Rivest keeps trying but fails. Anno stands up and says, Humans never stop setting people up. He announces that Ledriano casts not only Lihid, but also the Break Concealment, Delenos, a concealed barrier that seals the magic cast by a demon. Anno snaps his hand and the little mouse in the cage grows into a large monster, which scares everyone. He then casts Lihid magic to generate a holy sword. The headmaster wonders how a demon could do that. Anos tells him that the power of holy magic is merely on a different wavelength. In that case, Ledriano admits that he's the reincarnation of the Demon King of Tyranny. A royal student from the same academy as Anos disagrees with what Ledriano has said. He says there's no way a hybrid could ever be the Demon King of Tyranny. Laos hits the table to shut the royal student up and says anyone who could do better than Anos should show themselves now. Rivest turns to Laos and tells them not to criticize the royalty. The class murmurs but the headmaster silences the class. Ivis is seen at the window side reporting to Anos about what he's found and seen. He looks through the legends of Azishion, and there's no mention of Hero Cannon getting killed by a human. He also found an odd phrase in those legends handed down all by Hero Academy graduates. One day this utter darkness will once again consume Azishion, but have no fear. Offer hope along with your prayers to the legendary hero. For then, he shall appear. The spirit god, human sword Evans Mana in hand, and illuminate the world. The spirit god, human sword, Evans Mana, is a holy sword, forged to destroy him. The legendary hero will be hero. Kanan, and the utter darkness consuming Azishion would be Anos' reincarnation. Sasha and Misha knock on the door to call on Anos to attend a festival to celebrate the birth of Hero Jirga. While they talk, Anos sees Lei and Misa, where they're having their moment, and he wants to walk to them but Sasha stops him so he won't intrude. Lei notices that Misa is moody, and asks her if she's fine. Misa says that the Hero Academy students today all had a look in their eyes that she was scared. She asks Lei if he thinks there's gonna be a lot of bad blood, and Lei touches her cheek and smiles a bit. He says, Misa never returns hostility even when someone's hostile to her. Misa says that she's not that kind of person. Well, Lei gives Misa a necklace as a token of gratitude. Unitarian ladies see the necklace in Misa's name and they ask her how she found it. She says that someone put it on her yesterday and she couldn't get it off. Sasha says the story behind the necklace is romantic. According to Anos, it's the story of Mehense necklace about two human lovers who broke a holy seashell in half to create two necklaces, and they each wore one to ensure that they'd be united again after they were reincarnated. The story was quite tragic. At first, it became customary to make a single necklace out of two and give it to one's lover. Misha added that if one breaks the single shell necklace they gave their lover into two, it means, one is proposing. Then, the Unitarian ladies immediately turn to Lei to ask him when his marriage with Misa is when they get to know he's the one that gives it to her. The students are gathered at Lake Saimai for their inter-academy exams. The headmaster says each academy is to use its respective form of troop magic, Asla, or guise. In the Lake Saimai, there are underwater cities and caverns. The headmaster tells Miss Manu to pick a decent team of students and alters some words to belittle them. One of the royal students tells Miss Manu to pick their team so that they're going to rip the opponent to shreds. Anos tells them they can't even win winnable contests if they jump at such cheap taunts. Miss Manu agrees with Anos, but they'd have to make up enough numbers in his team before she can consider them. Anos adds the Unitarian ladies to make them 13 so a team is set. Rivest complains that the honor of their academy is at stake in the battle, and it won't be fair to leave it in the hands of a misfit. Anos agrees with him and tells him to make sure he exposes the enemy's strategy, or he'll just be piling shame upon shame. It's settled now. The headmaster begins the inter-academy exams, and while it goes on, Anos asks Miss Mano who Rivest is. She says Rivest was an underachiever when he first enrolled, and also hated the founding ancestor at first, but now, he's a royalist. 
Anos asks, what changed him? Miss Ross explains that Rivest wasn't good with magic developed for combat, thinking it's magic to annihilate, but he doesn't want to hurt anybody. Miss Minot told him that the founding ancestor felt the same way as him, and that which Guise is used for. After that, he gained respect for the founding ancestor far more intensely than anyone else, and was finally able to take pride in his lineage. Anos asks if the founding ancestor's beliefs can be found in the textbooks, but Miss tells him that if the founding ancestor's beliefs are all the students are to be taught, then they wouldn't need instructions. Rivest's team in the water is finding it hard to make use of their magic, and Rivest tells them to report to him on time, via leaks, as they search for the enemy. The heroes hit the team members off guard in the water and head to destroy the Demon King castle. The students outside could only see the Hero Academy students, and they began to wonder why it was like that. It seems like the Hero Academy students had something set up before the exam started. With his eyes, Anos could tell that there was holy water mixed in with the lake water, Holy water gives humans magic power, and it is toxic to demons. This is Anos experiencing the holy water being used this way, and he says the Hero Academy students are receiving an endless supply of holy water through their magical gear. Anos also suggests that there should be some kind of mechanism for controlling holy water, but Miss Manu says it's against the rules. Rivest and his team in the Demon King castle fire at the heroes as they move toward them, but the heroes block all their attempts. The heroes cast magic upon the Demon King castle which sucks away the team's magic power and eventually hit Rivest and his team. Miss Manu tells the headmaster to rescue her students in the water, else she will lodge a strong protest that the heroes will have to answer to. The headmaster claims to have his familiars summon people at the scene so it might take a while for him to rescue the students. Anos rescues the royal students out of the water, and Miss Manu runs towards Rivest to heal him, but it doesn't heal him. The headmaster says healing magic will no longer be effective on him because Rivest develops stigma after being severely wounded by holy magic. The headmaster claims that he won't know that the Demon King Academy students are this spineless to tell his students not to use such dangerous magic in an inter-academy exam. He tells Miss Manu to blame her incompetence not him. Anos wants to heal Rivest's stigma, but he refuses to be treated by Anos. Anos asks him if he's so weak that he can't submit to something unpleasant for his mentor's sake. Rivest can get the hero's school badge, the magical gear the heroes use to control the water that seals their magic power and hides the holy water. Rivest confesses that he's always hated Anos with every bone in his body, but for the first time, he wishes he had Anos's power. He tells him that he has fulfilled his role and should leave the rest for him. Anos asks the heroes to let them proceed to round two, and they agree. The heroes' only answer for the first win is that they make the most of home field advantage. The heroes tell them to drain the water if they're scared. Anos drains the lake, together with the holy water with his power. Then, he challenges the heroes to come down the drained lake for round two. The heroes fly down, thinking they'd have the chance to beat him after all he did to them. The headmaster tries to stop his students, but they won't listen. Miss Menu takes over and begins round two of the inter-academy exams. She tells her students to ensure they don't tarnish their ancestors' honor and pride. Anos uses the guys to create protection for themselves. One of the heroes asks if Anos is the second in power to hero canon, and if he's the demon king of tyranny. The other person admits Anos won't be a problem since they can hear Hero Kanan's voice speaking to them. The heroes use Asla to build a holy castle. Then they begin to hear a voice saying, kill, kill the demons. Anos throws a huge accumulation of fire at the heroes, but their barrier, Deagelia, is equipped enough to stop the threat, and a lady bursts the huge fireball with a sword. They need to find their way into the barrier, so Misha creates a topographical effect of a demon castle that will help them withstand the draining spell. It's going to take her three minutes to create a castle inside the barrier, and Anos is going to protect her. The heroes arrive at the scene and tell Anos that he thinks they'd just sit here and let them build a complete castle. The lady who breaks through the huge fireball joins them with the Holy Sword of Light Inhale. Anos commends her strike on the fireball and asks her for her name. She's unable to speak, so Ledriano answers in her place. He introduces her as Zeshia Kanon Ijaisika, the Hero Academy Rank 1 the reincarnation of Hero Kanon's fourth source. The heroes create an anti-demonic barrier to stop Misha, but Anos blocks and holds the ice chains in place. Anos thwarts their threat with the Jurist spell to burn them. Anos notices that the barrier is still up even after he knocks down the four heroes, and then he can tell that someone else is supplying power to the barrier. Misha has completely built the castle. Laos heals, and now he has to face Sasha, the Witch of Destruction. Helene faces Lei. Sasha picks Laos's magical gear, but he doesn't realize until he can't throw magic hits with his hand. He threatens Sasha with his sword and she drops the magical gear back to him. Then, he creates barrier Magic Burtis to hold Sasha still, and accumulates energy in his sword to slash Sasha, 
but he overheats, spits blood, and falls on the floor. Seems like his badge has been poisoned. She returned it to him. Laos thinks she's going since she can't break the bird as. Then she uses her demonic eyes to neutralize and break the bird as. Sasha burns him completely for being so arrogant towards her demon king. Helene creates an earthquake barrier in which Lei is fixed, and he casts Great Sacred Earth Sword, Zelio. He threatens to slash the wound he's inflicted with Zelio, to leave Lei with a stigma. And when this happens, healing magic won't work on Lei. He bluffs and he finds out that Lei cuts off his hand holding the Zele. Helion wonders how he gets to move inside his barrier. Lei tells him about the unique sword which transforms at will. He added that he's trying to see if it could take on sacred magic power. Helene's hand regenerates and he mocks Lei's sword and calls it a fake sword. Lei picks his holy sword Zelio to use on him. Maybe it could be an original one. He laughs because he doesn't think that a demon can wield his sword. Lei grabs the holy sword Zelio and hits it against the ground, which makes Helene stumble and fall on the floor. Lei grabs his second sword and moves closer to him. This time, he doesn't have the power to order Zeli. Lei tells him the same thing he told him when he was holding the holy sword Zelio. He screams as Lei slashes his with the holy sword Zeli. Anos finds Ledriano where he is lying but he seems to be feigning death. He stands up, removes his glasses and throws them on the floor. He casts Sacred Ocean Guardian Sword by Lamente to create a sword. Some seconds later, Zeshia attempts to slash Anos from behind but Anos is alert to stop her. She comes with several threats but has no aim to hit Anos. Anos grabs her sword and uses the sword to carry her and hit her against the ground. Ledriano tries his attempt from behind. Anos notices, and he quickly throws Zeshia at him, and they both hit the wall. Zeshia and Ledriano convert the souls of the people of Gyrodite, cheering them on into power. They both attack Anos with the great power of love that humans pride themselves on, but he thwarts away their attempts with Ask Magic Circle. The heroes had the support of 10 million people, but Anos says 8 is sufficient for them. Then, he calls on the Fan Union to sing and hand over their love to him. The Fan Union begins to sing and Anos can hit the heroes hard. Ledriano wonders how the love and emotions of 10 million people could be breached, but they couldn't breach the love and emotions of just 8 people. Anos tells them that the number doesn't matter, but the important thing is the urgency of the feelings and the ability to unify all the souls. He tells them that what they just showed him couldn't hold a candle to the emotions of the humans that Hero Cannon shouldered alone 2,000 years ago. A brainstorming spell is being cast and it affects almost everyone, including Misha, but she quickly comes back to her senses. In no time, the spell goes off, and Misha tells him that it sounds like hatred. Ledriano makes Zishia unleash a very dangerous spell of explosion against Anos, but Anos is alive and strong. Anos tells him that his life is not as cheap and can be exchanged for the future. Zeshia comes back the second time with the same spell, but the result doesn't come out as expected as Zeshia is being held in the air with Anos's hand. A voice inside Zeshia calls Anos and tells him to come to the shrine. The voice says no one can stop Zeshia except it. Anos tells Misha to go to the shrine while he takes care of what he started there. Misha gets to the shrine, but she can't find anyone. Sir Diego arrives at the shrine, casts Misha inside a barrier, and chants for Inhaley to grab a sword. Sir Diego threatens to show Misha how deeply humans resent the demons. He angrily chants, open, sacred gate, to release sacred light from a seal. The light hits Misha badly, and Diego stabs Misha from behind. Diego stabs her repeatedly, as he says he won't forget all that the demons have done to the human race. Misha tells him that he broke the rules. Diego shuns her and says he plans to kill a lot more. As he attempts to annihilate Misha's source so that she doesn't get resurrected, Ano stabs him from behind and throws him against the wall. He quickly heals Misha and turns to Diego. He makes him burn from inside to death as he asks him what he's up to. Anos resurrects him and asks him about the true objective of the academy. Anos could tell that it was Diego who cast the brainstorming spell. Diego seems to still be acting like a hero. Anos chants Nidra, the demonization magic, to transform Diego into a huge monster. In the case of Diego, his true nature manifests in his appearance. The huge monster says, he'll never forgive you, demons, and yells Jerga Kanan. He raises his hand and summons all the heroes to attack the demons, hoping that everywhere will explode but nothing changes. Anos tells him that he stopped time throughout the entire lake before Gavwell could go off. He attempts to attack Anos for mocking him, but Anos rips off his heart. Anos says a wounded source is more painful than even death. No human on earth could withstand it except for hero Kanon. That is why Kanon can stand him over and over again. Anos punctures the monster's heart while the monster itself feels the pain. He says Kanon's sources were ripped out of him, 
burned, smashed, and yet he still fought for the sake of humans. Anos added that Kanon is a great hero who repulses demons time and again. The monster tells him to end it, and Anos bursts his heart. Then, Anos says they shouldn't dare assume his name. Anos carries Misha in his arms, and they head to the shrine to meet Eleanor. On getting there, Anos asks her who she is, and she says that she's magic. Eleanor is created with a taboo magic spell that changes humans into magic, and so she's human magic. Eleanor. Anos could tell that she did not let the blast on Ledriano and the others didn't affect Dei Galia, and she took on the task of healing the heroes' mortal wounds. Anos doesn't want to use the Ravid spell so that everyone's source will explode, so he tells her that they need to dispel the Gavuel spell that Diego cast on Jerga Kanon. Eleanor tells him to let her out of the barrier first, then she'll find a way to take off the Gavuel spell. Anos believes her and unseals the barrier. She clears all the guys and barriers and helps maintain the hero's source. Eleanor sets out to tell Anos about the academy, so she shows Anos all the source clones she created, and they were all created by force, by the source magic Eleanor. If these people are killed, source and all, there's always someone else to replace them. There was a human who implemented it 2,000 years ago, the commander who led the subjugation army with Kanan, Jerga Kanan. Cannon. He had a deep-rooted grudge against the demon race. Even long after the Great War has ended, his greatest fear was that the descendants would forget the grudge toward demons, and that's why he created the Hero Academy. Jerga Kanon also twisted around the laws of magic to transform his source into two magic spells. One of them is Ask, and people believe that can gain guidance from Kanon by using Ask, but in reality, it's Commander Jerga's thirst for revenge. The thirst for revenge gets implanted into those under the influence of Ask, and that's why Hero Kanon is against it. She shows a video of of where Hero Kanon was killed because he was against Jerga's decision, and he never appears again. Eleanor guesses that he must have gotten tired of humans. Eleanor is the magic spell, but she was a bust. All the hatred was absorbed by Ask and very little remains of the commander's Herga's memories. Eleanor's role is to create source clones. She asks Anos for a favor to destroy her. She said she's been killing all these. She has had children for the last 2,000 years, non-stop. She says if these children could talk, there's no way they'd never forgive her. All of a sudden, one of the clones says Mama, and Eleanor walks up to the clone and cries as the clone calls her. Anos commends her for enduring this for 2,000 years and says he will grant her wish. He asks her if she'll be satisfied if he makes them all happy at once. Eleanor answers yes, and Anos is about to promise her when a man with at least four guards enters the shrine. The man asks him what he's doing with Eleanor. Anno sees his face and asks Eleanor if he's another source clone. Eleanor answers yes, and says Diego's the ringleader who spreads Aisk. She says as long as she's around, he'll regenerate endlessly. The man and his guards step forward to attack Anos, and some intruders who happen to be the seven elder demon emperors, which include Medion Garza, Zoro Angato, and Eldora Zaya, guide an unknown demon. An unknown demon draws Hero Kanon's holy sword. Then, the man orders his guards to do whatever it takes to get back the Hero Kanon's holy sword. The demons create a small fireball spell that swallows up the man and his guards. Anos observes the unknown demon's skills, so he thinks there can be no excuse for the unknown demon having the seven elder demon emperors with him. Anos asks for his name, and he addresses himself as Avos Dilhevia, the demon king of tyranny, who will destroy all. Anos asks him what he intends to do under a false name, and throws a huge fireball at Avos, but he calls him a fool and uses the holy sword to destroy the huge fireball. He says he's going to change the world into the true world of demons, swallow it up by this deep darkness, and there's no going back for anyone. Avos de la Via and the seven elder demon emperors disappear. A few days later, it's announced to everyone that history has repeated itself, and the deep darkness has returned. The deep darkness has assaulted the shrine and has stolen the Azishion's guardian deity, the thunder god sword, Evansmana. The legend turned out to be true. The demon king of tyranny has been revived after 2,000 years. He will lead the demon race in an invasion of their nation. However, the demon subjugation army will deliver the blow of justice so that the heroes can claim victory. The seven elder demon emperors declare that their lord has awakened from his long slumber, and he's allowed to give his speech about his second coming. He says he made a mistake in the past in showing the human race mercy by sacrificing himself. Humans haven't changed over 2,000 years. He's back to correct his mistakes from 2,000 years ago. This time, he shall annihilate the foolish humans. The people hail him, your majesty. Four of the seven elder demon emperors report to Anos that most of the demon lords have gathered around Avos Dilhevia and are heading toward the border. The demon king subjugation army is placing things to meet their attack. Anos admits that it's a battle he left unfinished 2,000 years ago. He tells them not to interfere in the fight, but to stand their ground that they can't just sit and look 
while Scoundrel is assuming the name of their lord. Anos's crew comes in to tell him they're all ready to stand by him no matter what. Then, they all agree to leave at daybreak, but everyone should get enough before then. The next morning, Lei notices a worried face on Misa's face and asks her what's going on with her. Misa says she just keeps imagining the worst. Lei tells her that he's not nervous about this fight at all, because it seems like he fought in the fight 2,000 years ago. Lei unlaces her necklace and asks if he could have it. Misa has heard people saying it means he's proposing, so she quickly mentions it to him. Well, Lei is aware of this. Lei wears the necklace and gives Misa his word that he will come back to her no matter what. Anos and his crew are set for the day and ask them if they haven't forgotten what it is they need to do. They say to prevent any skirmishes between the Dilhade forces and the Demon King subjugation army and neutralize them both. Lei added that they'll have to find a way to remove the grudge from Ask. Then, Anos orders them not to die and not to kill because they can afford to lose anyone over a trivial fight. The Azishion forces, the Demon King subjugation army have already positioned themselves to counterattack. The first to strike will be the Dilhade forces, but no one can tell Avos Dilhevia's way to survive. Misha and Sasha stop the troops gathering from the west in their attack. They tell them that their Demon King has no desire for war. Fan Union is positioned to focus on supporting the rearguard. Lei and Misa are to demolish the troops in the east to stop them from the border. Melhase and his men are to subdue the seven elder demon emperors, and Anos will take out Avos Dilhevia. Anos sends a fire attack to the Dilhade forces and tells them to inform Avos Dilhevia that he is the true demon king. Melhase tells Anos to leave False's king men for them, while Anos heads to Avos Dilhevia's castle. Anos gets to the entrance of Avos' castle, and the door opens. Misa calls on Sir Anos to tell him that she can't find Lei. Melhais reports to Anos that he has captured Medowin, Zoro, and Eldora, who were being manipulated by Avos, but it looks like the Sorsa has abandoned its hosts and fled. Melhais asks him if he'd deal with Avos later, but he says, no. Avos is seen walking through a bush when Anos appears and creates a wall where anyone can't get in or out. They begin to hit on the attack. From there, Anos recognizes that it's Hero Kanan. Hero Kanan came earlier before Anos to fulfill his promise. Then, he shows the necklace. He finally puts off the mask and it happens to be Lei. He asks Anos how he finds out that he's the one. Anos shows him the necklace and reminds him of the night he was Miss. Lei recognizes the single shelled. Only someone who knew about the Azacian myth would ever call it single shelled. This means Hero Kanan does remember his past. Anos asks him who he is because he knows of no one who can wield both a unique sword and a holy sword, but maybe Hero Kanan can wield both, only if he is resurrected as a demon. He added, he doesn't want him to find out who he is, playing the role of fake demon king, Avos Dilhevia. Another unforeseen circumstance is Misha being born through Dino Jixis. The fact that he cried when he lost his mother was genuine to Anos. So Anos admits that he must be trying to save something as he plays the fake demon king. Anos asks him what happened 2,000 years ago, and he says it was just as Anos said. And he says he was murdered by Jirga's followers. And then they set up a plot to annihilate Anos though thousand years later. He considered it an irrational mistake by the humans, and he had to rectify it. He mentions that Evan's mama has the power to nullify even destiny. So he made use of that to nullify Anos's destiny to become reincarnated as the Demon King of Tyranny. Anos asks him if that is why his name is forgotten. Hero Kanon says over time and little by little, history was rewritten, then Avos Dilhevia was born. Kanan says humans will always kill demons, and that one's only option will be to slay humans. The source of it all is the hatred toward demons that Jerga suffused Ask with. If Avos Dilhevia is destroyed, then the curse should also vanish. Kanan says he still wants to believe. He claims that he's a hero, and he has to make amends for their mistakes. He then said, he's yet to show Anos human kindness and the true peace that he desired. Anos then says, human lovers on their way to death would split a holy seashell in half to create two necklaces, and they each wore one to ensure that they'd be reunited after they were reincarnated. He tells Kanon that he can only get the necklace by force from him. They're both in to protect each other, but in a bad way. The fight begins, and Anos attacks Kanon in every way to destroy his sources. He destroys all the except one, but Karan believes that no matter how many times he loses, he will eventually win in the end. Kanon has always believed that the time hasn't come for him to risk his life for the peace that would come someday. But he was wrong, because there's someone he must save right in front of him. The fight continues, and he's able to find the source of Anos, through his heart with his sword. Anon uses his power to transfer his outfit to Karan, and Karan's to himself. He also gave the mask on his head. Then the walls he created begin to fall off. 
the people exclaim when they see them. Kanan asks Anos why he decided to do this. Anos tells him that he's following Kanan's script and it should extinguish human hatred. Anos turns to all of them and tells them to retreat until the day he's once again resurrected. He forbids them from seeking revenge on humans. He tells them to live until the day that the Demon King returns. Then Kanan tells Amos that both now and back then, he's the only one who reached out his hand to him in the end. Anos returns his necklace, and Kanan removes the Evans Mama from his heart, and he falls on the ground. Kanan announces that the King Demon is dead and the war is over now. Melhase tells the forces to retreat, and they will wait for the Demon King's return in Dilhad. All of a sudden, Diego screams that the people should not be deceived. The one who kills Anos is not Hero Kanan, but a demon. He calls on his 10,000 Zishia troops to self-destruct and annihilate the demon race. He says a single death cannot assuage 2,000 years worth of hatred. He says until the demon race is wiped out of the world, the war will never stop. Diego creates Ask and uses the brainstorming spell to compel people to start saying kill them. The Ask transforms into Commander Yerga. Yerga is disappointed in Kanon because he reincarnates himself as a filthy demon. Kanon, on the other hand, is disappointed in Yerga because he has given up his existence as a human and transform it into magic, whose only purpose is to wipe out demons. Kanon is going to nullify Jirga with his hatred. Jirga's body is true sacred magic and can't be destroyed with a holy sword. Misha and Sasha ask him why they should be judged by him. Jirga asks if they are Kanon's masterless subordinates. They tell him that they believe the Demon King will return. Ivis calls on his direct descendants for their time has come to unveil the Necron family's secret technique. They join and return to their proper form chanting Dino Jixes. They fight Jirka at their magic power peaks, and he gives them a taste of greed or despair, but they don't retreat until the Demon King returns. Anos commends them for they're able to hold on this long. Jerga seems surprised to see Anos' is back because he wouldn't expect him to resurrect after his source has been destroyed. Anos uses his enemy's attack as its origin to revive his source. It's fine by Jerga, as he thinks he'd be able to use his hands to kill Anos. Jerga calls on the people of Azishion and tells them that their land is about to be swallowed by deep darkness. He tells them to offer him their prayer and hope. If they do so, light shall extinguish the darkness. Anos tells him that if he drains the people's hope by force, their souls can never return. Well, Jerga says it's a noble call he's made to eliminate Anos even if it costs him his life. He calls on the sacred power of justice to strike Anos, but Kanan blocks it with his sword. Kanon and Anos fight together to break the age-old chain of hatred so that they can bring peace to Azishion and Dilhade. He hit them hard at first, and he's got a body of world order. For that reason, he believes he can't be killed. Anos chants, ask and calls on the fan union to sing so that they can overpower Jerga. Jerga sends to the land many magic swords. The Demon King's descendants and Eleanor join in the game in bringing down Jerga. They believe the founding ancestor fought for the demon race and now they are ready to prove their loyalty to him. Jerga says the war will never end, not until he annihilates all demons. He claims that human hatred will never vanish from the world, but the demon race's fate is to be wiped out. In that case, Kanon's job as a hero is nullifying such destiny. Anos makes it clear to Harga that it's not that humans hated the demons, it was him who hated him. Kanon and Anos can take him down, and their body transforms back into royal students and misfits. The same thing goes for Sasha and Misha. They thought he was dead, but he tells them there's no way he'd die. Lei comes back to meet Misa. Anos fulfills his promise to Eleanor. He turns her into his magic so she'd never be abused again. In the end, the forces bow to him. Anos and his crew arrive back home, including Eleanor. His parents are glad to see him again. Like usual, they thought he had come home with a new wife. Anos' mother prepares them. Mushroom Gratin. 